If you were familiar with Sucker Punch before 2020, then you knew them for making games about a silly raccoon that pulled off grand heists, and then for making games about a bald guy who controls electricity. But given the visuals of their previous entries steeped in fanciful worlds, nobody could have predicted that this... would be the next entry in Sucker Punch's portfolio. Ghosts of Tsushima is the story of Jin Sakai, one of the only samurai to survive the massacre of Komodo Beach during the Mongol invasion of Tsushima in 1274. In order to push back the Mongols and have any chance of saving his home, Jin must sacrifice his honor for the island and shed his former life, moving forward as the ghost of a samurai who died on the beach. Ghost of Tsushima is at times otherworldly, yet maintains a realistic foundation, though not in the traditional sense. When we think about realism, we typically imagine the dirt. Grime and grunge was at the forefront of seventh generation realism, perhaps because because we associate realism with the things we don't want to talk about. An idyllic world is a bright one. It's simple, clean, sterilized, tranquil. It's a world not many are familiar with. So we're forced to identify realism with the former, uglier reality. Serenity is not synonymous with the dirt, rain, or bloodshed, and yet, Ghost of Tsushima is one of the most peaceful games I've ever played. For every sliced throat is a luscious reed flowing in your father's guidance, and for every dishonorable takedown is a spirit's anger manifesting in a thunderstorm. Every peaceful spirit balanced by a vengeful specter. Sucker Punch, previously known for their excellence and realism, have created a game that, despite being more lifelike, is the antithesis of their last decade of effort. Yet, Ghost of Tsushima is much more than a constant stream of potential wallpapers. Its gameplay, whether an original idea or one borrowed and refined from others, is executed well, and the stories told throughout Tsushima strike a balance that allows them to deconstruct legends without invalidating them, and challenge a character's morals with hopes of redeeming them. Tsushima is a game and a land unlike any other, and its success is much the same. After three years of PlayStation 5 remaster and a free content update, there is plenty to discuss regarding the game. Feelings on both sides present the idea that this game is either THE Samurai game or exceptionally ordinary. Sandwiched between plenty of other games that took the world by storm, talking about the game now that the storm has passed could expose its true beauty or a more hideous hindsight. Ghost of Tsushima has an army of fans, but its clan of critics, while a minority, is far too vocal to ignore. For every review calling Ghost of Tsushima a masterpiece, there is one calling it mediocre, preaching that they just don't get it, primarily concerning the gameplay. Tsushima may not offer the most original stories, as like its inspirations, it aims to deconstruct the samurai code and parade its hypocrisies, but it offers something far more unique to the video game medium peace. Many games these days, while being cinematic, are doing so at the player's detriment. You'll never want to be more than a single stroke away from satisfying a feedback loop, even if that means bunny hopping across a map, souring immersion. As someone who shamefully desires that stream of simulation and has no interest in the samurai, I find it difficult to believe that this game captured me the way it did. And that's what I'd like to unpack alongside taking a deeper look at the beauty Tsushima has to offer. Ghost of Tsushima is a critique of the samurai way just as much as it is a story of its end. Jin goes on a journey down a path that takes everything from him, and he is supposedly one of the first of his kind to abandon the values he thought were timeless, to survive in a world that is quickly changing. Ghost of Tsushima is a third-person action stealth game, meaning it has legends to be judged alongside. While the recent actions of Assassin's Creed have been less than honorable, many still hold on to what the series used to stand for. While its spirit is alive in Tsushima, this does not warrant a comparison. These comparisons are natural, but are surface level. It's easy to spot the similarities between Ghost of Tsushima and even Red Dead Redemption 2, especially when journeying for long distances on horseback. They are two games that have beautiful open worlds, full of tranquility and turmoil, and Red Dead, like many westerns and samurai films before it, has a consistent theme of characters no longer having a place in the world, and with the choice to either adapt or die. Jin's legend should be evaluated on its own merits, and comparisons could imply that its quality only exists in the presence of contemporaries, though I understand comparisons are almost always made without malice. Furthermore, our concern should not be whether Ghost of Tsushima is a good Assassin's Creed game, as many discussions have surrounded, but rather, is it a good product? Is it worth your time? The short answer is yes. The long answer is much longer.
an island at war, a survivor's heart in turmoil, find peace in one's death. Before looking at Tsushima, we need to return to some equally beautiful locations, Empire City, Numere, and Seattle. Sucker Punch moved from the Sly Cooper series into Infamous, a new intellectual property that was a drastic shift from Sly. Infamous headed in the direction of a literal bomb site, covered in enemies made from trash, streets covered in bodies, and a main character that was as rough as they come. Empire City was in complete turmoil, and by the time Numeray came around in the game's sequel, we had a trend. The Infamous series was chaotic. There was always a means for players to put on a light show, and a way to rebel. Infamous is known for its powers, but also for its karma system, allowing players to choose between being a hero or a villain. While the feeling was stronger as a villain, there was always a sentiment of rebellion when playing. You operated outside of the law, and the freedom to use unconventional means of travel, like skating on electrical wires and flying, furthered this. This culminated in Infamous Second Son, where we see the idea of a rebellion taken literally, as Delson Rowe rebels against a militia sent to contain superpowered individuals known as conduits. The game has excellent presentation, with smoke especially being some of the best we've seen yet, and the game is a near constant war zone. We go from a city that's covered in chaos to an island with spots of serenity. Sure, there are moments of chaos in Tsushima and peace in Infamous, but it is completely different because of one aspect, which is the world. When out of conflict in Tsushima, the world is content, but in Infamous, the world is laid bare as a backdrop. Peace is not the absence of conflict, it's an active state. We can't conflate peace and tranquility with the absence of something because then these two scenes are the same, when they are truly fundamentally different. In many games, continuing with Second Son as an example, the absence of conflict sees the world dormant. There might be cars roaming around, people walking, but it doesn't feel alive. It might feel alive when in motion, as NPCs can react to a player's actions, but the moment you stop and stare, it's like you can see the lines of code underneath a character's skin. The world is waiting for your next move, but part of peace is is understanding that the world in fact does not revolve around you. It is exceedingly rare in open worlds for actions to be happening independent of the player, and we could never expect that. Games would never be able to look as good as Ghost of Tsushima if they had to simulate an entire encounter in areas players might not be looking. But Ghost of Tsushima solves this problem by showing signs of action. Throughout the world, there are patrols, dead bodies, and smoke that always indicates an outpost under Mongol control. Whenever you arrive at a cloud of smoke, it's fire, a standoff, another haunting from the ghost, but it's never dull. Now let's look at a a beautiful lookout where nothing is happening. What can we see in the distance? A breathtaking skyline, leaves falling like a winter snowflake, and Komodo Beach, a burning memory. The beginning of the invasion, and where the action is, or was, at a point in time. But what makes this scene peaceful is not that there's no action, it's that there is. You know it. You can see it. But it's not here, and it's not now. Tsushima is an island in ruins and at war. There's no questioning the trauma that the island and its people are in, but the waves continue to wash against the shore, the seasons continue to change, and this brief window into a Tsushima at peace is where we can look for motivation and hope. The people have had their lives turned upside down. Where they once looked to the samurai for protection, they found failure in the name of honor, and where they once saw home, they now witness its destruction at the hands of animals. While you may not find such tranquility in these war zones, you will still find beauty. There's something so satisfying about seeing blood splatter from a sword slide coating the snow like a thick wine. There's also something so gorgeous about a battle that is raging in a world that couldn't care. Dueling with a ronin as your movements kick up a dance of petals around you is something few games can provide, and the greatest challenge of these fights is not being distracted by the sun that is always beaming at the perfect angle, the rain that can elevate the tension of a fight, or the leaves being shed from an overhanging tree that while obviously scripted, feel natural and independent of what is happening. Even the cutscenes are meticulously crafted. The camera work is always in a position to showcase the nature, but what sits in the forefront, the characters' faces, are equally masterful. Faces convey emotion as well as any other AAA game, and yet they're not needed. It's simple to praise facial technology in a product, and that task is no more difficult here, but our character has the option to wear a mask for most of the game, and even a shrouded helmet, too. When the face is obscured, we can see that the body is as much a vehicle for emotion as any pair of eyes. Ghost of Tsushima remedies a common crossroads I find myself at. I enjoy anonymity, and that reflects in my outfit choices, but if I can't see my character's face, how can I know what they're thinking? Here, Jin's shoulder position, where he points his shrouded gaze, and the delivery of his voice conveys exactly what he is feeling at any given moment. In some cases, covering your face even enhances a scene. When in a tale that sees a character confusing you for your father, the premise is further sold when wearing the Sakai clan armor. And my point about not needing facial expression rings true in this scene too, as it still breaks my heart thinking about it. Furthering the beauty on display here is the lighting. 
which shows versatility from shrouding Jin in complete darkness and coating his presence in a heavenly orange. Tsushima understands this beauty, as their photo mode encourages you to bask in their technical achievements, toying with different photo techniques and dressing up Jin in your favorite outfits. The outfits for Jin all look great, and mixing and matching them allows each player's ghost to be somewhat unique. Your outfit often reflects your playstyle, which has elements of choice in it too. Someone covered in ironclad would likely take part in standoffs, whereas someone in lighter cloth attire would likely stick to the shadows. Jin is given many choices throughout the game's challenges. In some cases it was sink or swim, and in others it was drip or drown. And in both, I was a buoy. I kept my attire light with reinforced armor on weak points, opting for a practical black dye over the whole outfit, except for the mask, which was a fiery red. I wanted Jin to push past the ghost and become a demon. The ghost is a legend, a ten foot tall figure with fire in its eyes, intent on slaughtering Mongols, and while that may not be the truth in Jin's case, Tsushima is not new to myths and legends. A trend within games I've played is the rationalization of myths. Every larger than life figure has to have a reason for existing, an explanation, or in some cases, a way to undermine mind the legend. It's a cynical way of presenting the world. I understand the choice to not allow Bigfoot to just casually exist in any game, but allowing myths to simply be enhances Tsushima as a location. One of the ways Tsushima is both put on full display but made to be a mythical location is in the Guiding Wind. In order to keep the heads-up display minimal, there is a near constant gust of wind that is blowing in the direction of where you should go. The game heavily infers that the wind at your back is the spirit of your father. No matter where you are, your father is with you. Your mother also watches over you as golden birds will glide alongside you, and if you follow it, you'll find some kind of activity or collectible. All activities have associated landmarks, fox dens are shrouded by a golden tree, hot springs clouded in steam under the cover of red leaves, and an archway marks the beginning of a shrine you must ascend. Tsushima doesn't need a fox symbol taking up the screen's real estate, as the yellow leaves visible from a mile away communicate what activity is there, while also providing beauty. At every peak, you'll find something worth exploring, and what these activities illustrate about Tsushima is that there are sometimes otherworldly experiences with no logical explanation, or at least, none the game insists on providing. How is the spirit of your father able to guide you to your objective? It doesn't matter. Why do these foxes lead you to shrines? Because they just do. I'm not implying that having no explanation for mechanics is inherently a a good thing, but when a world like Tsushima is providing a story in a world that is steeped in a heavy romanticization of the past, we can go without explaining everything. I realize that there are exceptions to this. In one side quest, a woman believes that a kappa killed her father, but in reality, it was a gang of bandits. Jin himself embodies this contradiction too, as while many believe the ghost is a vengeful warrior and larger than life, Jin is a humble samurai that has done more to embarrass his family and name than anything else. While all the Japanese in the game is automatically translated to English, the Mongols are left in their native middle Mongols. Mongolic, which further immerses us in Jin's struggle. It's easy to see the Mongols are heartless killers when they aren't humanized even through language. We can't understand them and their shouts, some of which I hear in my sleep by now, are plainly foreign. Our lack of understanding plays narrative roles too, as when Koten Khan shows up speaking our language having learned Japanese, his claims of knowing how the samurai think and what their weaknesses are hold more weight. I understand I've likely presented Tsushima as not of this world when, the truth is, there's plenty of the relatively mundane. Towns share similar architecture but have divine features. Temples act as universal safe havens, and the many forts are a challenge to infiltrate. Sneaking through the different homes and shacks either over or under, enhancing the perception of the ghosts is endlessly satisfying. Some have taken issue with the repetitive structures, but personally, I feel there are only so many ways you can make an archer tower in the massive locations like Castle Canada or Castle Shimura, are proper gauntlets that are visible from all corners of the map. The townspeople all go about their everyday tasks, and while there is a sense of depression, given what everyone has lost, there's still hope for Tsushima to rebuild. But first, you need to clear the Mongols out, and that can be done in spectacular style. When approaching an encounter, you can choose to stalk from the shadows or start a standoff. The standoff is as much a fulfilling power fantasy as the duels are. In duels, the camera shows two warriors facing off, and there's a building tension around when Jin is going to draw his sword. When will the Khan be ambushed by the storm of Clan Sakai? The tension followed by the action is tantalizing, and the same is true for the standoffs. Not only is it the more honorable and more difficult route, but it also showcases in the slow motion the blood splattering out of a Mongol. Combat, the takedowns, the action is all presented so well that calling the game cinematic doesn't scratch the surface. Each mission that you start and end is given a title card, highlighting the details of the world. Cemeteries are filled with flowers left from loved ones, crickets singing to comfort the dead, and Mongols looking to pillage the graves. Homes are filled with beds, cooking pots, supplies, storage, people, and yes, a home that looks like a home is not necessarily worthy of praise, but it makes the world feel alive and lived in. When you see a temple in the distance and you've been there, you can recall the people 
people you've met, the places you've seen, and if it's a place you have yet to visit, having an idea of what might be in store is enticing enough. It's just a shame that you'll be sidetracked to places that are often less interesting. A running theme throughout Ghost of Tsushima that I will unfortunately have to harken back to is that it is a repetitive game. Often it's repeating something great, but when you find an activity that isn't great, prepare to face it again and again. For me, the best the world had to offer were the haikus. They present beautiful scenery and offer a chance of reflection, which is an important aspect of feeling at peace. It's about going through a conflict, a hardship, and coming out the other side, reflecting on the events, and understanding that even if there is more hardship to come, you have a moment now to breathe. The haikus themselves aren't much to write poem about, but the serenity they offer is topped by none. On the other hand, we have the fox dens, which see you following a fox to a shrine. At first, this is a novelty, you can even pet the silly little guy, but after doing this 48 more times, it became nauseating. There is a ridiculous overabundance of fox dens, whereas there are only 19 haikus. I think the solution to this is not more haikus, shrines, or outposts, but less fox dens. The open world has plenty of things to do already, and I've seen the argument that the fox dens act as a fast travel point, which is true and convenient, but again, if cutting the fox stands in half means I have to traverse a world as serene as this a bit longer, I think I'll survive. What is at times just as good as the marked quests and activities are those that are unmarked. It was not uncommon for me to stumble upon environmental storytelling, a cart abandoned and ransacked in the middle of the road, a body hanging from a tree on the outskirts of a camp to ward off potential wannabe heroes, a note left behind from a family praying that their son makes it out to the shore, with hopes of escaping this nightmare. If the seemingly endless Mongol ships skimming the Tsushima shoreline or any indicator, they didn't make it. There are so many stories to be told here, we don't need another fox tale. A final side note about the island in the presentation as a whole is the historical accuracy of it, which is that the game is very quick to sacrifice accuracy and I believe that choice is great. During this time period, samurai rarely used swords, which didn't become common until years later, but using a bow the whole game wouldn't be very fun. Further, the different biomes and mountains are not perfectly accurate, but again, when the world is this masterfully crafted, to hell with accuracy. Tsushima is an island with beauty that can only be understood through playing it. I can show screenshot after screenshot, but it simply won't compare to being there yourself. There's so many biomes, luscious violet flora, desolate scorched soil, lethal tundra. It's all beautiful, and I don't think the English language has words to properly describe its grandeur. It simply has it all. Peace, war, desperation, hope, reflection all reinforced by a soundtrack that damn near brought a tear to my eye. This is the most beautiful and peaceful game ever made, but nothing is perfect, and there will always be a balance. Ghost of Tsushima has some glitches, and while none were game-breaking, I'd be dishonest if I didn't mention it. It's mostly minor visual errors or some goofy ragdolls. I was fortunate enough to not encounter anything too harsh, but others have. Fortunately, performance seems to be perfected across the board. With few frame drops, and in my case of 50 hours, I experienced just one. This should surprise you as it did to me, because remember, this was Sucker Punch's last series. I find it interesting that the presentation of Ghost of Tsushima is a full 180 from Infamous. The UI is cleaner and less prevalent, its world more luscious than apocalyptic, and the music is more subdued. During the mythic tales, we can see the spirit of the cutscenes that nearly defined Infamous appearing, and the many silhouettes that showcase your legend give off that same aesthetic. Everything else is cleaner. You could argue that the rebellion Infamous indulged in is still present here, as we can turn our back on the samurai way, but the game isn't trying to make us enjoy it as much. When first straying from the samurai path, you're your takedowns are haphazard and dirty, but as you progress through the game, naturally upgrading your tanto, you'll see an increased efficiency. Not only are these animations faster, but they are showing an element of comfort from Jin. His combat abilities don't see the same change as he's been trained in sword combat since he was a child. Instead, his transformation shows us how he uses the ghost abilities mid-combat. Reinforced by how effective these tactics are, Jin's samurai fighting style continually degrades throughout the playthrough. A contrast is again seen, similar to how peaceful the game is, but the most notable is the direct opposition Ghost of Tsushima as gameplay is to infamous. Deep as the ocean. Break through the frozen surface. To behold balance.
Gameplay in Infamous is projectile based first. Melee is always viable but often secondary, collateral damage is a near guarantee, and the game excels in presenting a battle between you and seemingly the rest of the world. Ghost of Tsushima presents melee as being the most optimal and range damage as the secondary. You'll be outnumbered most of the time too, but it's within the one-on-one -on -one fights that Ghost of Tsushima is an undeniable 10 out of 10 game. It's just a damn shame that there's more to it than that. Combat is at its best in an open area with a few enemies, and if they're in overwhelming numbers then it's at its best by the end of the game when you have all the abilities at your disposal. The game convinces you that there's a choice between being the ghost and being a samurai, and both playstyles are rewarding in their own way. Progression in Ghost of Tsushima is unique in that the most difficult part of the game is the beginning, and enhances the narrative. Jin is completely outnumbered and let's be honest is no match for more than a handful of Mongols, and in gameplay, the player is new to the samurai way and struggles to grasp the controls on top of having no upgrades. Brutes will be a massive pain and the Mongol captains will be genuine challenges, but you can take out those brutes and most other Mongols with one button, silently. You want to live the samurai fantasy and fight with honor, but when you're throwing yourself headfirst into a 10 on 1 battle, at what point are you simply dying in the name of an honor code your enemies at most entertain? What furthers this conflict is just how quickly you will die, and how quickly the game throws you into large seemingly impenetrable forts. Your health is slim, attacks limited, resources non-existent. In every way imaginable, you are encouraged to go ghost. But what is interesting is that by the end game, being a full samurai is more appealing because it's easier, which shows how the player and Jin will, if under enough pressure, try a less honorable approach. Another means of progression is within Jin's life. Legend. Increasing through every push against the Mongols, Jin begins as a wandering samurai saved from Komoda by a stroke of luck, but early on, Yuna weaves tales of Jin being more than a spared samurai, instead a ghost, hell-bent on revenge. A silent knife in the dead of night, his body an endless silhouette, his face a demonic red, and his katana as swift as a blink. In Act 1, Jin is yet to live up to his legend, but by the end, you'll be the exact legend I described. These abilities that allow you to do this are acquired through Tsushima's tales, and by earning technique points, rewards for growing your legend. Up Upgrades feel meaningful and offer advantages to gameplay outside of simple damage buffs. Chain assassinations are some of the downright essential skills, and extending your standoff is equally valuable. Being able to block spear attacks and execute perfect parries and dodges were so integral to mid-game combat that I could sympathize with the argument that they should have been part of Jin's base skill set. You can collect charms that further assist Jin in damage, detection time, and many others, and they create minor differences but are appreciated for creating devastating endgame builds. Combat is played either offensively or defensively, and there are accompanying systems to make both viable. If choosing an aggressive approach, you'll engage with the stance system. Jin has multiple stances unlocked through observing and killing Mongol leaders that are effective against different classes of enemies defined by the weapons they use. Spears, swords, shields, and brutes. Who can wield both swords, shields, both, or neither? As the game progresses, you'll run into enemies that are a pain rather quickly, which will encourage exploration for more leaders. Brutes specifically will be punishing, perhaps uniquely to me. If the Souls games taught me anything, it was that dodging towards an attack to make the greatest use of my invincibility frames was the key to success. Here, this is not the case and you will need to actually dodge attacks. It is my fault, but damn it, it made me want to delete these brutes as fast as possible, which can be done through staggering. Using the correct stance will do more stagger damage to the corresponding enemy, and this is important for aggressive players, as whittling away stagger bars will be the primary means of creating opportunities. On paper, it sounds simple. You swap to whatever stance is needed, spam triangle, and repeat for any new enemy type. In reality, this is harder than it seems, as you have to keep track of multiple enemies attacking at different times from different angles, and arrows will often be raining down too. There's a lot to juggle but this doesn't stop many from feeling that the game is easily mastered through pressing triangle over and over. Unfortunately, if you wanted to roleplay as an honorable man, then your options for aggression end here, as kunai, smoke bombs, grenades, and the sorts would stray you from the Bushido path. Many players found themselves spamming triangle throughout the whole game, and it's true, that strategy can work. Fortunately though, you can also create openings through exploiting your enemy's attacks, and eventually this becomes the most effective means of dispatching Mongols. Parrying will see Jin use his sword to deflect an attack, and since the perfect parry will make differentiating between a normal parry parry and a perfect one tedious, I'll refer to the parry as a block and a perfect parry as just a parry. You can parry an enemy's attack to leave them fully exposed, but you can also dodge at the right time to perform a devastating counterattack. This opens the way to playing defensively, and mixing this with the offense is where you can pull off some of the best combos. All of my highlights begin with a parry, and the highlight just creates itself from there. The game is slowed as their stagger bar is shattered, only to speed up again as the slash comes down. Once the enemy is on the back foot, you can further pressure through attacks that are more effective against staggered foes, making encounters trivial, and that's a problem. Ghost of Tsushima truly is an easy game. Stealth in many games has a skill floor that, as you show more patience, gets lower and lower. The same is true here. If you wait long enough, then an opportunity will eventually present itself. The purpose of tools like wind chimes, chain assassinations, and even the advanced hearing that functions like any other Eagle Vision-esque ability is to streamline the process of gathering information and waiting for pieces to align. Need someone in the right spot for a kill? Lure them with the chimes. It makes stealth challenge the execution of an entire base, rather than the execution of a single Mongol. Your real challenge is moving through the 
base assassinating who you want and how you want to. My challenge with all these bases was that I enjoyed leaving the commanders until the end. It was satisfying to imagine they're minding their business and the moment they realize it's a little too quiet, they see their entire camp slaughtered, and often, it's the last thing they do see. The AI is admittedly dense, not in the deep way, but there was enough variety here such as the enemies with headgear preventing a ranged takedown, and their tools like birds that can spot you, or watches that must be disabled above all else. Stealth unfortunately does nothing new, often borrowing ideas from contemporaries. If comparisons to Assassin's Creed weren't already here, then they certainly will be after seeing the poison and berserk darts. It's a familiar system, and thus, unless this is the first stealth game you've played, you'll find yourself not needing a tutorial, and there's little to excite you. Okay, maybe slicing a Mongol leader's head clean off is a never-ending dopamine rush, but underneath the flashy kills you'll find a system with restrictions strictly defined by the player. I try not to use smoke bombs or chimes too much so I can make stealth more challenging and immerse myself in Jin's position, aided by the slower takedowns of the unrefined Tanto. When in combat, the challenge is often the same. Defeating a single Mongol is easy, and even a handful is eventually elementary, but it's doing so with the desired swings and strokes that make it satisfying and difficult. One of the abilities you obtain from a mythic tale is the Dance of Wrath, which will see Jin striking his opponent three times with devastating damage and inhuman speed. This can be a one hit on three different enemies or three hits on one. The catch is that this particular attack will consume three points of resolve, which could be spent on other abilities or could be stockpiled and used for healing in the event that you are struck. There's an element of risk to moving with such aggression, and it means that you need to build up to that speed. In many cases, I'll perform parries and perfect dodges which build up extra resolve on the first enemy or two, and then finish off the weaker enemies with the Wrath Dance, finishing the fight with lightning-fast momentum. If your goal is finishing a battle as quickly as possible, then you'll already not care. The aforementioned strategy I employed kills enemies in cinematic fashion, but it's not swift. The combat is most rewarding to intrinsically motivated players, whose satisfaction comes from their own goals, notably fulfilling a power fantasy. Ghost of Tsushima excels in providing a power fantasy just as Infamous did, and the reason I believe the combat was designed for the intrinsically motivated is because the game never challenges your ability to swing a sword, but the ability to swing it with intention and finesse. By the end of Act 1, you'll come across Straw Hat Ronin that are more advanced than the low-ranking Mongols occupying Izuhara. Their attacks have a shorter recovery time, and many attacks will see them sheathing their blade, preparing a slash for what feels like an eternity. This slows the fight down for a moment, and builds tension as you wait in anticipation for your opponent's attack. You must be patient and calm so you can perfectly dodge this, and counter with your own cataclysmic cut. But this tension disappears when you realize you can also just walk up and hit them. The entire time they're charging this attack, you can just hit them for free. This works because it allows the player to maintain control of the fight's pacing, but it means this attack isn't challenging. The point is to challenge players who enjoy perfect dodges and enjoy the fantasy of a samurai duel. Even further through the story, you'll have enemies lighting their blades on fire, making every attack unblockable, but this does not mean it's undodgeable, and using the perfect dodge to turn their advantage against them is satisfying and challenging, but those wanting to just get it over with will find that swapping to the water stance makes easy work of them, as if they were no different from six hours ago. Even boss fights suffer from this, and yet this is consistent with Sucker Punch's previous outing. Infamous has never been a difficult series aside from a few exceptions. Commonly, you'll be going on a rampage, often without much challenge. You're overpowered, yes, but the enjoyment comes from enjoying your powers. Where this differs from Tsushima is in the skill required to look cool. There's skill required in your aim and positioning, but Tsushima has a greater focus on timing and engaging in defensive strategies. Where Tsushima also differs from its predecessors in the boss fights, and quality is not where the contrast ends. The spectacle was top priority in Infamous, but in Tsushima, mechanical challenge plays a larger role, and while the presentation is cinematic and the visuals at times unbelievable, they don't top the downright insane fights in Infamous. Most one-on-one -on -one duels will be challenging for the same reasons basic combat is, and yet, it is Ghost of Tsushima at its absolute finest. The katana, digitally, is designed for single-target elimination. When there are five Mongols around you, it's not a 5v1, it's a 1v1 times 5. Each attacker requires focus, and the moment one is on the back foot, another is stepping in to demand your attention. It results in situations where the player lacks agency within the fighting pace. The exception to this is if you have enough resolve to use abilities that turn the fight in your favor, but these situations are rare, and you'll more often be attempting to build up that resolve, which again, is something dictated by the AI. There's another problem with the group battles, and it's one I struggle to present because, simply put, I don't know if I'll be able to beat the skill issue allegations on this one. The camera is not great, and Jin consistently struggled to swing in the correct direction. This should not be confused with enemies intentionally dodging your attacks. If you attack an enemy, they will either block it or sidestep the attack, which will result in Jin being committed to swinging at the target's previous position. That mechanic is executed well. The issue I raise is where, despite wanting to swing at a particular enemy while pushing the stick in said direction, Jin will either miss entirely or at times swing behind him. It was consistently frustrating, and I'd assumed the lock-on feature, which the game does not explicitly show you, would solve this problem. 
I was wrong. This feature was added as part of a free content update and it shows, because while the lock-on does in fact work, it shifts the camera down, meaning you often lose sight of the surrounding enemies. This also doesn't solve the problem entirely because Jin will still have slight inaccuracies. The lock-on is just a band-aid fix, and it feels tacked on because it is. The reason you could argue this is a skill issue is that I've always had issues with the DualSense controller, but my only anecdotal argument against it is that I had the same problem on PS4 where the controller is much more comfortable. Once again, this issue was solved by limiting battles to just one enemy, especially later fights see your foes moving with speed, aggression, and precision where the less skilled are consistently on the ropes. Agency over the fight must be earned through matching or exceeding the skill of your opponent, which makes finishing said fights all the more satisfying. Again, this is where the challenge is, not in winning the fight, but controlling it. When control over the fight is not needed to win, there will inevitably be people who are not motivated by control. Those like myself who are obsessed with maintaining control find this combat system to be deep not in challenge, but in the ways we can manipulate situations towards a desired outcome, not unlike the combat of others like Devil May Cry, where the inherent challenge is in creating on-the-fly choreography to follow, and redirecting as your enemies try to go off script. Combat as a whole is fun, but its excellence when the stars align make the rest of the game so much darker in comparison. When striving for style in one-on-one -on -one duels, Ghost of Tsushima is difficult because it requires timing, patience, and rewards creativity. In larger groups, Tsushima is difficult because of the ineptitude of its systems. It almost appears as though the combat was designed around these one-on-one -on -one fights, and later on minor tweaks were made to make them acceptable in a group setting. The only reason I focus on these minor issues so much is because if I instead listed everything that worked, this portion of the video would be triple its length. While the ghost is a demon designed to deliver death, killing is not all Jin is capable of. Movement is satisfactory, and the climbing, while linear and at times finicky, is serviceable for what the game asks of you. Platforming will always be minor, with small consequences for failure, and furthering this forgiveness is how strong Jin is magnetized to the designated climbing hooks. I appreciated a dedicated button for dropping down to handholds, as it prevented any accidental falls, too. Once the grappling hook is introduced, the climbing becomes a bit more enjoyable, because who doesn't love swinging on a rope? But also because it can allow for a rapid descent. Fall damage comes easy, and if you spawn an anchor point halfway down a cliff, you could take a leap of faith and catch yourself with the hook halfway. Pressing the dodge button just before hitting the ground will transfer your momentum to a roll, which will negate some fall damage too. When you aren't hoofing it idiomatically to your objectives, you'll be hoofing it literally on horseback. You can choose from a few horses at the beginning of the game, and even give them a name, which allows us to feel attached early on. I named mine Kage, because I intended to utilize the shadows wherever possible. Jin connects with his steed quickly, even promising more than once that eventually they will go for a peaceful ride. You'll find that after many outposts, Jin and his horse are hanging out, napping together, or just bonding and it's nice. Riding the horse feels good, but I was not a fan of the horse's inability to swim. From nearly any point in Tsushima, your companion will hear your call, and in reality, they're loaded off screen. If they happen to be close by, then they'll make a short gallop over, but the point is, is that if they can't get to you, they will call on the spirits to teleport them. If you find yourself at a body of water, say a small river between you and your objective with no convenient bridge in sight, you'll have to get off your horse, swim across, no matter how brief, and then call your horse again for it to appear next to you. Allowing the horse to swim cuts down tedium and does not break realism. People swim with their horses all the time. If the reason for not allowing swimming was for realism, then this does not solve it, because a clearly teleporting horse is far more immersion-breaking than one that swims. A minor nitpick, but again, finding ideas of critique is like grasping at straws. Areas with loot are far easier to find as they are practically all around you. Leather, wood, bamboo, iron, hides, and supplies will be required to upgrade your weapons and armor. Armor as it evolves will develop more extravagant designs, thankfully with the option to return to previous states, and weapons will offer minuscule visual changes but noticeable damage increases. A maxed out katana will cut through early game Mongols like butter, and an upgraded halfbow renders headshots optional, but these take time. If you collect supplies wherever possible, you'll be leveling gear at a steady pace, creating a position where Jin, now with a blade sharp enough to cut diamonds and enough resolve to eat an atomic bomb, can reliably stick to the samurai code. No desperation means no need for the ghost. But even with this newfound power, the ghost continues obstructing the samurai code. Halfway through the game, as you begin poisoning Mongols, slaughtering them through clouds of smoke and tall grass, you'll take the final step towards becoming the ghost. Decapitating a Mongol commander, and without words, declaring that the same fate will become of anyone else that stands in your way. You could argue that Jin becomes the ghost when he poisons the Mongols at the end of Act 2, or even in the final decision during Act 3 depending on what you chose. But I would say that is when Jin embraces the ghost, finally conceding that that is what he's become. The Siege of Yarikawa is when the transformation is complete, and the poisoning of Mongols is when Jin is too far to come back. Even if he from that point forward continued to live with honor, his reputation remains. Killing with honor now does not erase what the Mongols know you're capable of. When they first arrived, they were comfortable fighting the samurai because 
because they knew their limits. Many samurai would follow their honor code to their deaths, and almost all of them did. But Jin doesn't follow those rules, and the Mongols fear an enemy they do not know. All of this, stacked high above the stories of Jin's combat prowess, led to many Mongols running from battle. There is a problem with this setup, though, which is the player understands the strengths of this game and fully immerses themselves in the way they want to play, which as previously stated is where the challenge lies. If you only used ghost tactics when there was no other choice, such as a tutorial, you will still be forced to hit that breaking point of decapitating heads and poisoning drinks. Regardless of one's quest to follow the rules at every step, they will be treated like the ghost. Admittedly, this was not a problem for me, but I was still disappointed that this was the case because something Ghost of Tsushima vaguely implies to the player, furthered by online discussion and expectations given Sucker Punch's previous three games, is the choice to stay honorable or tarnish the Sakai name. The truth is, you don't have a choice, and while I can understand the disappointment, the game from every angle is a story of Jin becoming the ghost through gameplay and story. As mentioned, in the early game, it's significantly easier to use the ghost abilities, and by the time following the samurai code is viable, it's too late. Sticking to the samurai code is also severely limiting the gameplay, and without this wavering honor, there wouldn't be much of a game. I wish I had a theoretical remedy to this, because it truly does plague the game, but I'm out of ideas. I believe that the way the game handles the illusion of choice is the best route, and any potential solutions would involve reworking the foundation of the game, which is too solid to seriously consider. At this point, we've scratched the surface of the foundation this game sets. Hell, we haven't even talked about the bows and their associated skills, which while standard, follow suit in that they are executed competently. The issue Ghost of Tsushima runs into is that it often does not build off this foundation in meaningful ways, leading to what is the largest gripe against the game and the reason many never made it to its excellent end. Refined, but not new. Repeated, but not expanded. The prowess remains. Tsushima is an island unlike any other, but when looking at its map, it'd be hard not to have flashbacks to your last encounter with Open World Syndrome. Semantically, Open World Syndrome is a disease that causes open world games to have a plethora of boils developing over their maps, often in the form of different collectibles or menial tasks used to make a game seem more dense with content than it actually is. Since it's already been brought up, Assassin's Creed is a perfect example. I love Assassin's Creed Unity, flaws and all, and the map they built is aesthetically pleasing until you introduce the hundreds of icons that cover it. A few of these markers are missions helpful icons indicative of stores are necessary even if not providing content, and yet, the overwhelming majority are pointless collectibles. Hundreds of cockades that are simply picked up, chests containing little more than cash, and anyone who has 100% completed Unity, which is me by the way, can tell you that this content is mindless. Ghost of Tsushima suffers from this too, but to an albeit lesser extent. The biggest difference apart from the amount is that they are all mechanically bare. To illustrate this, let's look at all of the activities available to you, excluding the outposts and side quests, which might seem disingenuous at first, but I assure you this is necessary to understanding why someone wouldn't like the world. And I promise to be as quick as possible with this. Throughout the perimeter of the island, you can find eight lighthouses that need to be relit. You can do this by climbing the ladder to the top and lighting them. Occasionally, there are enemies to stop you, but it is rare. You can find 23 pillars of honor, which are stone pillars containing cosmetics. Walk up and press a button. Then there are 18 hot springs where you can take a bath and reflect on your journey, rewarding you with health and taking two inputs from the player. To increase resolve, you can complete 16 bamboo strikes, which require you to press a sequence of inputs fast enough. Nothing revolutionary, but I will admit these aren't bad. For some charms, you can climb 16 Shinto shrines, which will see you pressing R2 a few times to climb, and not much else. To relax from all that climbing, you can reflect on the world around you through writing 19 haikus. These are just a few button prompts and contain cosmetic rewards. Finally, there are 49 fox dens, which will see a fox guiding you to a nearby shrine that you can pray at with a press of a button, for a charm slot upgrade, and eventually charms. All of these activities reward you with small incremental increases to your stats or a cosmetic. In the case of the haikus, poor cosmetics at that. A total of 149 activities, and their rewards are often negligible. In the world, there are 68 side quests, 5 duels, and 56 outposts for a total of 129, and a grand total of 278 things to do in the world, discounting the collectibles and main missions. Overwhelmed yet? So, all of this is to obsessively highlight how mechanically repetitive the world is. Pillars of Honor, Hot Springs, Haikus, and Fox Dens require minimal player input. I will not include the Shrines because they offer a platforming challenge even if minor, and the Bamboo Strikes because they take more than a few inputs. This leaves us with 117 activities that require virtually no player input, 40% of what you do. 
The reason Assassin's Creed Unity could get away with it to an extent is because traversing the world was the input. You had to climb to your collectible, and that was a constant opportunity for expression. Here you simply fast travel near the objective and or ride your horse. Now, let's look at why someone would not enjoy the outposts in this game. Mechanically, there's depth to be had all over. You can sneak, go in loud, and... You see the problem? At its core, you're always presented with a few Mongols, by the halfway point in the game, all of which can be stealthily killed in one shot. What makes this worse is that nearly everything you do in the game is an outpost. Forget those on the overworld. Plenty of side quests follow the same structure of go to a place, clear out the Mongols, gather information, and repeat. It's not all of them, and that is important, but it's enough. Even within certain plot lines, there comes repetition. Have you noticed that during Lady Masako's questline, she is often speaking aggressively to a character before Jin has to go in and calmly convince the person to aid them? She does this five separate times over the nine missions. I understand where these criticisms are coming from, but I don't agree with them because I believe that mechanical depth is not all that is needed for an enjoyable experience. For example, the hot springs and haikus are just a few button presses, yes, but they are also moments to truly reflect on the events of the game and the themes present within it. It's a moment away from the war, and if the scenery alone isn't enough to convey that, then the contrast should. They add to the world, as do the Pillars of Honor. Often around the pillars you can find fallen civilians, victims to Mongols, bandits, or their families. A reminder that the only peace some find in Tsushima is in death. The fox sends are the only part where I stand with the people who dislike them, as they're simply too many and they don't shake things up often enough. When discussing collectibles, I've seen a common rebuttal which is that players are not meant to get them. This retort has become common among the Korok discourse within Breath of the Wild, where many have criticized the absurd amount of Korok seeds in the game, and the counterpoint is that you're not meant to get them all. The reason they are abundant and easy to nab is so that the player never has to spend too long searching for some, and this is actually supported by the fact that all the useful rewards cease once the player collects half of them. The problem with this argument is that it is being wrongfully applied to other games. I've seen on discussion boards people saying that you aren't meant to visit all the hot springs, fox den, shrines, and while I understand that, that isn't the same. The first problem is that Ghost of Tsushima encourages you to visit these spots. There is a songbird that will lead you to these places, there are question marks on the map begging for answers, and there are even upgrades that allow the wind to guide you to certain activities, and there are rewards tied to each and every one of them. The game wants you to find them all, and that alone justifies their completion and disappointment. I was severely disappointed when I arrived at a question mark and found another fox den instead of any of the other activities through abundance alone, especially when the world was full of so much to do and so much of it enhanced the world or the serenity. It's always a difficult criticism to come out of unscathed, because if I say there are too many, someone will say that I could have just not done it, but if I opted to not do them, then the same person would just as likely say that my opinion held less weight because I hadn't experienced the whole product. Most players won't find every collectible, but most players will do a lot of outposts, and there's plenty to like and dislike there as well. The first time you approach a Mongol camp, it is unique. You're forced to move through the camp engaging in stealth, relying on bushes, height, and some cover to mask your movements. Wait for the right time, and you strike. You'll eventually be spotted, and when you are, it's when all hell breaks loose causing a clash with the remaining Mongols. This will also be the case for the next camp, and the next, all the way until you've done them all. There is no change to how you approach these camps outside from bases containing Huachas, as instead you'll focus on destroying it before falling to the same old routine. In fairness, the early game has the Mongol commanders that cannot be assassinated, but this challenge is nullified by the halfway point of the story. Ghost of Tsushima is excellent at providing you with new tools and abilities to try out on the Mongols, but it struggles to force creativity out of the player. Let's assume you approach three enemies in a group. You could use your arrows to pick them off, use a berserk dart to turn them on each other, but risk alerting the base, unleash a nearby animal for a similar effect, or just drop in with the chain assassination and clean them up in seconds. The problem here is that there's no restrictions. A good stealth game is one that requires you to adapt, and in Ghost of Tsushima, you will never need to adapt. As much as it's been beaten into the ground, the reason Mr. Freeze in Arkham City is such a good fight is because you're forced to try different strategies, consult the tool belt, adapt to the changing environment. Tsushima dips its toes into this with the eagles that can spot you, but they are so easy to kill and show up so rarely that I barely remembered them. I would have appreciated Mongols with helmets and armor that prevented them from being killed by arrows, and further, how about in some of the snowy environments have certain enemies wearing snowshoes and because their movements are so quiet, Jin can't detect them with his heightened senses, so he has to instead track the footprints left behind in the snow to know where they are. These are simple ideas, and truthfully, I'm not a game designer, so take a pound of salt with these ideas, but the point remains, outposts provide no external challenge or incentive to experiment. Much like combat, the fun from these come from wanting to play it your way. Maybe it's restarting when you're 
are spotted are only using the Tonto. My reason for wanting to use the Berserk darts is because it's immersive, not in the realistic sense, but in that I am, just like Jin, crafting the legend of the ghost. Imagine a Mongol suddenly turns mad and those around him begin to believe the ghost has possessed his body. Perhaps I'm meeting the game more than halfway, but the other scenarios work too, such as clearing a base purely through arrows or using only the Tonto, not being spotted at all, and so on. For those naturally inclined to try different things for the sake of variety, there is plenty to love here, but those wanting to just complete the objective will again find the game to be a breeze. This alone is not a fatal flaw, but it becomes more frustrating when nearly everything in the game is an outpost. This is something I've indirectly spoken about for the whole video. The largest criticism against Ghost of Tsushima is how repetitive it is. Forget the 50 outposts already in the game, let's look at actual mission design. The first mission is on Kamada Beach, not an outpost. The second sees you moving through a town with Yuna, more or less an outpost, but it's a tutorial so I give it a pass. Then you get on a horse and move through Castle Canada, which is essentially an outpost. Then we help Yuna by clearing an outpost. Then we clear out Azumo Bay, an outpost. Then we help Sensei Ishikawa by clearing an outpost. Then we help Lady Masako track down a killer and clear an outpost. Then we clear out and defend Komatsu Forge. Then we have a battle alongside Straw Hat Ronin, no outpost. But in the next, we help the Straw Hats clear a lighthouse outpost, and an outpost in the form of a boat. Then we do a final outpost raid with the Straw Hats, this time with a grappling hook, and we cap off the chapter by storming the gates of Castle Canada, a multi-sectioned outpost. There are boss fights, tracking, dialogue, and cutscenes in between all of this, and I know I risk being extremely reductive, but there is one mission in the entirety of Act 1 where you are not clearing an outpost. In Act 2, things improve significantly, and the same goes for Act 3, but there are still too many outposts too close together early on. This is why so many people found themselves dropping the game after Act 1. When I first got the game in 2020 when it released, I dropped it just after Castle Canada because I felt that everything you did in the game is just an outpost, and for those that care only for the mechanics and for completing the objectives in front of you, that is true. So, all of this explanation is to adequately showcase both sides of people who like and dislike the game, but what I'm concerned with is, should we hold it against the game? Is it right to critique a game based on not appealing to our tastes? I don't like Metroidvania, specifically the backtracking, so am I right to criticize a Metroid game for having too much backtracking? There is variety in the gameplay of Tsushima, but it is the player's responsibility to utilize it. So is it the game's fault for not encouraging it enough? Hell, they are actively discouraging most of the ghost weapons, at least narratively. Or is it the player's fault for not experimenting more? I don't have an answer, and I know that's a cop-out, but really, who am I to say? Fortunately, there is the most variety in the mythic tales, which as the name would imply, often have a supernatural twist. Learning the legendary heavenly strike by having the move used on you is fun, and journeying up a mountain so cold that you have to scramble from one campfire to the next is a welcome variety. Eventually, they even place a bear on a tucked away ledge that mangled me and then threw me off the mountain to my death. The rewards for these are usually practical, even if the means aren't. To get a very basic longbow, you'll fight a demon in an arena of crows that slowly closes in, forcing aggression. There's an argument that even these quests are repetitive, as they're admittedly an abundance of following footprints, and nearly all of them end in a duel of sorts, which can be repeated as much as the game wants because they're always fun. But the truth with all of these tales and gameplay mechanics is that there is variety, and the repetition only comes from purely looking at what it asks of you. Yes, 40% of the activities require barely any input, but that's not necessarily the point. The haikus offer a chance to reflect and bask in the scenery that has earned its right to show off. The hot springs offer insight into Jin's psyche, and how he's dealing with the events of the game. His stoic demeanor rarely drops, and this introspection is not exclusive to bathing and writing, as the many tales will not only reveal more about Jin, but critique him and his methods too. I'll be separating the tales into two categories, world tales and character tales. Despite the differences the name implies, the other difference is in how they reflect on the story. World tales often feature anything from a mundane encounter to a tense duel, and are a look into Jin helping the people for the sake of it. The character tales see Jin assisting a character and working through some trauma, and learning learning more about them and himself along the way. After recovering from Komoda Beach, we can find the wife of Harunobu Adachi, who is the first to see the Mongols' exploitation of the samurai's honor. Masako had her family slaughtered, her husband, her children, her grandchildren. She was the only survivor, and our goal is to help her find the one responsible and come to peace with her tragedy. Through the quest, we can see that Masako is a flawed person, but nevertheless undeserving of her fate. We learn that she, in her state of grief, is hot-headed, and we learn that she was not as honorable or as loyal as she appears. When tracking down her former mate, it's revealed that the two had an affair. My only major issue with this questline is the pacing, as its midpoint feels a tad meandering, but the twist that it was in fact her sister that orchestrated everything was interesting. So was the realization that Masako, in her attempts to mend her sister's jealousy, fueled it further. The tale comes to a satisfying conclusion, and we see Masako finally learn to hold back a bit and allow her sister to end things on her terms, even if said terms are bitter. 
The duel against Masako was satisfying too, even if it felt a bit contrived. You might be surprised to hear that this is what many consider to be the weakest character tale, which bodes well for the rest of the content here. I felt it was solid, but I think its label as the worst is misplaced, as the actual worst is Kenji's story, but I imagine many of you forgot his. This is by and large the most significant criticism I can levy against these tales. It's insignificant. Kenji's missions usually see him coming to Jin for help, feigning some lie to convince him for the help, and by the end revealing that he was in trouble because of a malicious act, usually trying to scam someone. Even when these scams are for a noble cause, Kenji has to learn to use his skills for the betterment of the island. Kenji isn't a bad guy. We first meet him by seeing that he's working with the Mongols, but not in the way that we first suspect. We find that he is delivering alcohol to them to keep them drunk on sake instead of blood. He serves as comedic relief for most of the campaign, and the same is true for the side quests. It's a nice break from the heartache found elsewhere. As you liberate a camp with Lord Shimura, you'll discover some warrior monks were being tortured. Among the few you save is Norio, who is distraught over his brother's death. Norio, through helping the people of Tsushima alongside Jin, must not only come to terms with his brother's death, but the survivor's guilt that he feels. His brother was a legend among the people for being extremely skilled, and Norio is just not going to live up to that, or so it seems. He feels like it should have been him to die because his brother would have done so much more. The mission structure here is nothing new, but it will at least entertain. An issue all of the side tales struggle with is repeating the same few objectives. It's talking to someone, following a trail, defeating some Mongols, and it rarely strays from that path, and the times that it does gets lost in the Sea of Outpost. Norio further begins to question the monk's way of living, and this all culminates in a siege against a temple where he finds his brother, tortured and without limbs. I must admit, this struck me as oddly hilarious. Trying to keep composed though, this is otherwise a big moment for Norio, and it's when he goes off the deep end. After some time alone with his brother, deciding with him to end Anjo's life for the sake of himself and his legend as the guardian of Tsushima, Norio vows to get revenge. We later meet Norio at a camp near a Mongol outpost, where after a conversation we get some rest to strike the next day. When we awake, Norio is gone, and some locals inform us that he has lost it and is at the Mongol camp. When we arrive, the whole camp is ablaze along with the Mongols at the hands of Norio. This this chaos, the way the people speak of Norio, the way the Mongols are running, begging for their lives, does it not look familiar? I saw this moment as the game presenting the actions of the ghost from a third party. This is what the rest of Tsushima sees when we clear an outpost. Severed heads, burnt corpses, and a camp reeking of iron from all the bloodshed. This moment is done so well because we see Norio as a rather ordinary yet skilled fighter. We are expecting him to be half dead, if not worse, but when we see him, he's relatively unharmed. Our thoughts of how likely it is for Norio to be dead parallels what others must thought of the ghost at first, and the natural response to Norio saying he enjoyed it, feeling as though he might not be all there. Should we not question the same of Jin? This is a major theme within Norio's tale, hypocrisy. The idea that the advice Jin gives is often contradicted by his own actions. He encourages others to not lose their honor. Meanwhile, he has killed an entire army without a sliver of it. Jin would advise against Norio's actions here, but Jin alone has taken down countless outposts. But there's a difference between Jin and Norio. When we take down an outpost, most. We do it to serve the people of Tsushima. Norio does it to get revenge and he revels in it. Jin has to remind him of his duty, and while he can't stop the war from changing Norio, he can stop it from consuming him, just as Jin can stop the ghost from doing the same. Overall, Norio's quest started off slow, but he slowly turned into one of my favorites. Seeing him transition from feeling as though it should have been him to die, to then finding a new reason to move forward and do what he can with the life he has left, was well done. Another entertaining side story is with Sensei Ishikawa, a skilled archer that was unable to come to Komoda Beach because he had quote-unquote seen enough. Yeah, this is one of the few side characters that is an actual samurai, and he acts accordingly. He's arrogant, standoffish, he lies, and yet, he's charming. He reminds me of the too old for this shit teachers that I've seen in real life far too many times, and despite his rough exterior, Ishikawa has a heart that shines through on many occasions. His arc surrounds a former student named Hironori of Clan Nagao, who after being taught the way of the bow, used it to start a rebellion. The samurai had to defeat him, and Ishikawa was forced to cease his teachings after that, but it's not the story most know. Our introduction to Hironori is through a tale of an archer that used the way of the bow with honor, and one who died for the island, fighting bandits. Ishikawa, after a long time of isolation and guilt for what Hironori had become, met a young girl named Tomoe. He had reluctantly trained her in the way of the bow, but she too would use this power with malicious intent, as she began using it on old bandit allies, and eventually when the Mongols attacked, she began teaching them the way of the bow too. We don't know why she's done this, but as we continue investigating, we have an encounter with a woman named Matsu, who explains her aspirations and dreams, if she can make it off the island to safety. Matsu also says some questionable things, and personally, I had the idea that she might not be who she appears the moment the game revealed her identity, as though Jin and I had a light bulb go off at the same time. She explains that she did what she had to in order to survive, and this seems true. If the Mongols planned to kill her like they did most of the others, giving them a further advantage would buy Tomoe time, but her time ran out, and the Mongols turned their back on her. 
leading to her now wanting revenge and seeking the help of Sakai and Ishikawa. Ishikawa's feelings are mixed though. He has an internal struggle because as much as he hates what Tomoe did to him, he's not sure if he'll be capable of ending her. He planned to adopt her, hoping she would be his heir. Ishikawa, from the looks of it, doesn't have anyone, and he now, twice, has seen his students lose their honor. The most tragic part of Ishikawa's story is that it happens a third time. Jin learns the way of the bow, and yet he is another failure to Ishikawa, as he is deemed a traitor and his clan disbanded, and the Shogun wants him dead. The moment he gets over Tomoe, Jin is yet another student, dishonoring the Bushido way. Ishikawa, despite being so strict, does eventually cut Tomoe some slack. After helping her defeat the Mongols, she is nowhere to be found, and after correctly assuming she is on a boat to the mainland, the two have a clear shot at her, but decide not to take it. Ishikawa lets go of what he thinks is right, and he decides that Tomoe can live, so long as she does not come back to Tsushima. Ishikawa's tale is so interesting because he's an unlikable character. He blames himself too much, he's often dismissive or outright rude to Jin, and continually lies and conceals his thoughts. But slowly learning more about him made this tale one that while not having the larger revelations like Norio or Masako's, is consistently evolving, and learning some of the new bow techniques makes this one of the more engaging tales gameplay-wise. It's not often I chose the way of the bow when in combat, but the missions here were structured to encourage it much more, and when the headshot sounds are this satisfying, you can see where the enjoyment with this tale comes from. Tomoe is much like Jin, simply doing what she must to survive, and if Ishikawa can forgive her, then maybe the rest of the samurai could forgive him too. All of the aforementioned characters appear in the story briefly, and often the purpose of their inclusion is to kickstart their side quests, but that is all but one. Yuna. Yuna has a consistent role in the story, saving Jin on multiple occasions and being near integral to the plot at every turn, and yet she still has a story to be told. Not of her life moving forward, but of her life before the invasion. In her tale, we explore her past as a peasant, and we learn that it was not kind, to say the least. It's revealed that Yuna and Taka were child slaves, and were likely forced to commit unconsenting erotic acts, leaving the pair scarred. But they were not the only ones, as a woman named Ichi attempts to escape with the siblings, but she was recaptured. It's not as though Yuna and Taka didn't care enough to go back, but they couldn't. Yuna throughout the entire game is resilient and strong. She has the strength to save Jin twice, defeat Mongols, overthrow Castle Kaneda with Jin, and yet, a farm with a few huts has her traumatized to the point of not being able to enter it. With all this strength on display, having Yuna unable to physically face her past is an ideal way of presenting how much that camp had hurt her. Her arc is notably shorter than the rest, but that is likely due to her increased presence in Jin's story. Fortunately, as far as gameplay goes, this was an excellent set of missions. Sneaking into the farm had a restriction of only killing the commanders and nobody else, meaning more care was given to each movement. It was the exact kind of unsatiated craving I felt throughout the rest of the game. The questline even ends with a decent duel, but now's as good a time as ever to mention that many duels, some inside and main quests, are basic enemies with a larger health bar. When it's the other way around, it works. The Straw Hat Ronin fight very similarly to Ryuzo with a smaller health bar, but because we have to fight Ryuzo first before the Straw Hats show up in the world, we are already familiar with the moveset. When the Mongol commander at the Siege of Yarikawa is a basic commander I have fought over ten times up to that point, the grandeur of the fight is soured. And the same is true at the end of Yuna's quest. Altan is built up as this imposing threat, and yet he fights and worse goes down, like any other Mongol. Regardless, the presentation of these fights and the power fantasy make them worth the time, and the story told here is one of the most tragic in the game. By far the most tragic tale in all of Tsushima is of Yuriko, who also has the shortest tale. We meet Yuriko when returning to our family's homestead. She reminisces over the memories of Jin and his father, and we see a Jin that is in rare form, having dropped the stoicism. In their first meeting, they discuss Jin's childhood memories, but it's in the second meeting that Yuriko begins to seem... odd. She's coughing, and the memories being discussed are now unfamiliar to Jin. We can begin to gather that Yuriko is likely suffering from dementia. Her spiral is not pretty. At first it's a wholesome look into the memories of the best day of her life, but it quickly turns to her chasing hallucinations of her mother into the forest, and it's clear her mind is an unorganized collage of fading memories. I've had a similar experience, interacting with someone with dementia, someone who had forgotten every day that their husband died years prior. At first, she was reminded, and then grieving, every day, but quickly that obituary turned to a white lie, another overtime shift, another traffic jam. He'll be home soon. It's a difficult dilemma. Do you continue correcting them, trying to bring them back to Earth, or entertain their reality, and ease their confusion for however long they have left? It doesn't matter who's next to Yuriko. So long as she believes it's her love, then she can go in peace. And she does her final moments to the sound of Kazumasa's voice. It's not often games hit me this hard. The entire sequence was handled with care and was delivered with masterful performances. I was sold the entire time and I wish I could explain why, but this felt so much more real than all the other tragedies. Maybe it's because it's the most tangible and it's something many are too familiar with. I mean, someone plotting to have their sister's family killed is so tragic that it leaves realism, and someone having their limbs cut off being left as a torso and a head borders on comedy, but this, watching someone's mind decompose in a still living body, it's different. Sorry.
The tale itself, despite having the story and scenery to justify minimal input, has some variety. You write haikus with Yuriko, ride with her, protect her from the Mongols, and it allows us to be the best tale in the game. The character-specific tales in many ways are a reflection of Jin. Ishikawa and Tomoe's conflict is much the same as Jin and Shimura's, even down to the adoption. The student having to sacrifice their honor in order to survive, and a sensei that is entangled in the samurai code to their own detriment. Jin speaks of Tomoe as though she's a clear-cut traitor, and while that is true, it's not that simple. Jin encourages others to fight and die with honor, but excludes himself. Through Masako's tale, he learns that sometimes it is those closest to you that can hurt you the most, and by the end of Jin's journey, the same conclusion is drawn. Overall, the side content here is quite good. It might not have the same epic set pieces as the main game, but it certainly has, at times, greater emotional tension. The repetition of the gameplay stands high and casts a shade over it, but for those who enjoy the stories told here and the art on display, you'll find value. The same rings true for Jin's story, but with the added caveat that the pacing is weak in the first act, likely due to the density of the first island compared to the other two. Almost all tutorializing, outposts, missions, and collectibles are at their most frequent here. Despite this, the story remains memorable, and has seen an adequate amount of praise over the years. The Death of Honor. The Parade of Its Dead Carcass. A Vengeful Ghost Snarls. Ghost of Tsushima opens on an excellently strong note. The Battle of Komodo Beach does everything right to convey who these samurai are, how they fight, and how they are exploited. The game assumes the audience is familiar with the pop culture portrayals of samurai, and the samurai in the game remain in this fictional history. While the true samurai were far different, the game has never tried to feign much historical accuracy. Regardless, if there is one thing samurai are known for, it is their honor code. They fight by a set of rules and values, and the samurai maintain power under these laws. They are seen as highly disciplined, skilled, honorable warriors, but when their strength is known across the world, so are their weaknesses. As a samurai approaches Koten Khan, the leader of the invaders, he's showered in wine and set ablaze, a symbol that communicates that mercy will not be shown, and says, you may strictly follow your honor code, but we do not. The ensuing battle is a massacre, and it's believed that all the samurai are dead. Jin, assumedly protected by his father's spirit, is able to be nursed back to health by a thief named Yuna. At first, Jin is still arrogant over his place over Yuna in the hierarchy. Soon, he will come to the realization that his place on the social ladder means nothing when the situation is this dire. With the samurai on the back foot they no longer set the rules, and if they try to play by the rules that don't apply, they end up like the rest at Komoda Beach. Jin, before retrieving his sword and with still broken armor, decides foolishly to storm the gates of Castle Kaneda. He, learning nothing from Madachi before him, challenges the Khan and surprisingly, the Khan meets him on his terms. This battle is the exact moment where Jin is forced to see that the samurai cannot win. He is bested by the Khan in battle and is thrown off a bridge, and this cements the foundation of the argument for the ghost. Jin lost to the Khan at his own game. The Khan played by all the rules and still decimated Jin, and there's no way for the player to win here. The battle between the samurai and the ghost rages on throughout the entire game, and the same point is brought up time and time again. The ghost can achieve what the samurai cannot, and how far should Jin go? How much of himself should he concede? for his people. Throughout the opening act, as Jin rallies what remains of Tsushima's warriors, we see multiple flashbacks that reinforce what honor means to Jin, or what it is supposed to mean. Jin's father was killed by bandits, and his final words were a call for Jin to help him, and yet Jin was too scared to act. This scarred Jin, and he's carried this guilt his whole life. Fortunately, his uncle Shimura took him in and taught him the values of honor, which is to serve our lord and live with discipline. In this early scene, we can see a difference between Shimura and Jin, which is what they prioritize. Both believe that protecting the people and serving your lord is paramount to the samurai way, but Jin, unlike Shimura, will prioritize the people over his lord. Honor to Jin has always been about doing what needs to be done to protect the people of Tsushima, and even if he achieves this outside of the samurai code, he is still upholding his idea of honor, or at least his moral standards. Yuna begins to, perhaps unknowingly, exploit this weakness in Jin's ideology. What does dying for one's people mean if there are no people left? What does honor mean to the dishonored? The Mongols won't play by the rules, and it's clear that the lords, notably Shimura, don't know what they're doing. The Mongols have already beaten the samurai 
samurai ideologically, and any attempt by the samurai to take back the land will be and have been shut down. The commanders and their Khan have studied them to the point where the only thing capable of stopping the Khan is something he does not understand. This culminates in Jin's first dishonorable move killing an enemy from the shadows. The way the game portrays this first kill is exceptional, as we see Jin not only struggle physically to take this life, but mentally too. Mesmerized by the mess he's made before Yuna has to snap him out of it, Jin from such a young age was taught to look his enemy in the eye, strike quickly and with control, and he has done none of that. He, for assumedly the first time ever, fought dirty. It's not fair but neither was a Mongol invasion. This transition is the focal point of Act 1. We build up this idea of the ghost, and we develop Jin's skill set. It's within Act 2 that we see Jin weaponize the fear his presence generates, and how his uncle reacts to the ghost. Act 2 is where the game's pacing picks up, though at the sacrifice of the pacing of Act 1. The culprit is Jin's allies. A majority of the missions here set up the side characters that'll help Jin on his journey, but that journey does not move very far when you're so focused on the prelude to Ishikawa and Masako's side quests. Kenji is introduced well enough, but his questline isn't great, so even there are struggle to praise it. It's not as though these quests are unneeded. Recruiting your remaining allies is integral to the plot, even if gameplay demonstrates that Jin alone could run through a small army. The issue merely arises when we look at how long it takes to gather our allies that we begin to understand why so many drop the game after the first act. While forging ties with Yuna and Taka, we defend a forge, save its people, and clear out the Mongols. The people see us in action, and Yuna begins weaving the tale of the vengeful ghost. It's inferred that this is the moment that the ghost legend begins, and I wonder if Yuna had the intention of inspiring so many with the ghost legend. If so, then this is yet another way she is integral to the plot, and it's a shame she never gets much credit for it in the story. But then again, it's not the point. Jin himself rarely receives credit for being the ghost. Many know the myth, but not the man, and most that do, don't appreciate what the ghost represents. The most compelling of the characters met in Act 1 outside of Yuna is Ryuzo. Ryuzo and Jin have a long history with one another. It seems Ryuzo was a peasant growing up and had a duel against Jin during a tournament that, had he won, would have resulted in Ryuzo being promoted to samurai. Jin unfortunately won, and with fierce aggression, leaving Ryuzo bitter and looking to the straw hat Ronin for a career. This bitterness is still ever present in their current interactions, and it's easy to sympathize with him. The samurai were highly respected, and had many benefits that would permanently change Ryuzo's life, but he lost to someone who was born a samurai, someone who had all the resources and training from childhood. I think nearly everyone has had that kind of jealousy for someone who seemingly gets handouts at every turn, so Ryuzo is easy to sympathize with, and this is furthered when Ryuzo's goal is to simply take care of those that once took him in. It makes his betrayal come from a mile away upon closer inspection, and yet it doesn't sour the twist. If Ryuzo were to help Shimura, there is a chance that after all of this is over, he could again be given the chance to become samurai, but this option is never explicitly explained. Also, Ryuzo may dismiss the samurai even more now, especially after their failure to protect the island. As Jin helps Ryuzo find food, his men are captured and once rescued, he doesn't find beaten and bloodied prisoners, but straw hats that are well fed. This is an offer that transcends the language barriers, but both Jin and Ryuzo play dumb, in what appears to be an attempt to not let the other know their thoughts. Ryuzo pledges his allegiance with Jin and is expected to make an appearance at Castle Kanada, but alas, when the final strike against Castle Kanada is upon us, the Straw Hats are nowhere to be found. What further makes me believe that Jin knows of Ryuzo's betrayal is that he doesn't worry much for Ryuzo and instead stays focused on the siege, despite the Straw Hat being integral to their success. Before we head into Canada, we can speak with the rest of the team, which is a feature I enjoyed. Before every major battle, you can touch base with your allies and they'll even remind you of unfinished side quests with them. It's a small feature that heightens my attachment to these characters, and my guilt in that despite bathing in 15 different hot springs, I have still left Masako's tragic quest on the back burner. Once inside Kanada, the Ryuzo betrayal is performed and executed well, but it's all overshadowed by the excellent boss fight. This fight was challenging as hell when I first played it, but it never entered unfair territory. Once defeated, we can move to the end of Kanada, but our Khan is in another castle, Castle Shimura, with Ryuzo and the Straw Hat by his side. We rescue our uncle and have a moment of calm, but it's not long before we speak with our uncle further regarding our actions. The entire conversation is vague. Throughout Act 1, Koten had told Shimura of our dishonorable deeds, and who we have aligned with, but Shimura has no confirmation of it. Coupled with Jin's shame that forces him to admit doing only what he had to, and we have a Shimura that doesn't want to believe Jin did those things, and gives him the option to, more or less, pretend it didn't happen. In retrospect, I would call the first act the weakest, as while it starts incredibly strong, everything from its massacre to the title card that has been overused so much in other reviews I refuse to show it here, it's all paced well. Even the admittedly long flash 
flashbacks of Jen's childhood or the words that echo in his mind with each cowardly deed are presented well, but things begin meandering when we spend all this time essentially building up side quests. I believe that if these quests better evolved Jin's story, they would not have felt so tangential. Have Masako speak more of grief, and have her and Jin bond more initially over that shared grief. The Masako mission and story is good, but I can understand why it felt like it halts the main plot to set up another. Fortunately, the same cannot be said about Ishikawa's tale, as there are many references to fear being used as a weapon, a foundational skill for the ghost, and it serves as a tutorial for using the bow, justifying its inclusion further. Though I wouldn't want these missions to be removed, they are a necessary introduction to these characters, but reworking them could have been useful. Cutting out one of the Straw Hat missions would have helped the pacing too, as it's at that point too many outposts, not enough development, and I would rework Masako's quest this year having missed the slaughter of Clan Adachi, and we would have to help her retake control of her clan's home from bandits while discussing our survival at Komoda. Masako can, at this point, not know her family has been murdered, and could stress great importance at her family being alive and assumedly held hostage inside. This could then lead to her offering to help Jin in exchange for retaking the house, and once she realizes her family is dead, she can request Jin's help in finding the culprit, leading to her side quest. Aside from these, honestly, minor issues, Act 1 is strong for most of its run. It makes sense that it's the longest in the game, as its island is the most dense, but with how swiftly things move in Act 2, I might have preferred a more condensed structure. Ironically, Act 2 begins slowly, and we leave our luscious Izuhara for an initially more desolate Toyotama. Much of this island is scorched by the war, but there's still plenty of beauty to see and bloodshed to be had. Our goal now is to rally the people of Yarikawa, contact the Shogun on the mainland for reinforcements, and return to your home. Our allies are still on board to fight the Mongols, but Yuna wants safe passage off the island. Shimura will grant her this, but only once she's helped him secure Castle Shimura, which shows a strange willingness to manipulate the situation. Yuna already nursed your nephew back to health twice, and helped save your life, and to pretend she had not earned her way off the island is a blatant manipulation. Yuna is adamant that this is not her fight, only aiding Jin to ensure her and her brother's safety, but Taka is inspired by the ghost and wants to help where he can. This is another theme present in Act 2. The first act sees the ghost as a rumor, the second evolves it into a legend and a symbol of hope, but first, Jin has some loose ends he needs to tie before the ghost can completely take over, and to do this he returns to his family's home. Jin's home is an uncomfortable place to be. There are plenty of flashbacks to this area that almost feel otherworldly, and said flashbacks containing Jin's family are best left forgotten. When we arrive, we meet Yuriko, who appears to be the family's servant. She reminisces with Jin and allows him to emotionally take a load off for a time, even if that includes visiting his family's grave. Eventually, he finds his father's old armor and dons it, though at this point it feels almost disrespectful to wear the armor of someone who upheld such a strict honor code while performing a coward stance through tall grass. We also help our uncle get in contact with the Shogun, allowing us some bonding time while we speak around Jin's actions. Shimura is being careful not to outright shun him because Jin did save his life, and given his previous attempts, honor wouldn't have gotten him far. It makes me believe that he is somewhat grateful for Jin's cowardly methods, even if he does dislike it. Once the Shogun have been called, we must recruit the people of Yarikawa, but their history with the samurai is turbulent. There was a Yarikawa rebellion against Clan Shimura, but both Clan Sakai and Clan Adachi banded together to help Shimura stop them. This means that the people of Yarikawa, while not intent on joining the Mongols, don't want the help of the rest of Tsushima. Jin convinces them by aiding them when the Mongols storm the city, and it's here that Jin crosses another line. Before, Jin was sowing fear indirectly. He did what he had to, and his unpredictability made him scary, but there was still hope in the fact that samurai aren't trained in a cowardly way of combat, even if they can be convinced to participate. Now, after slaughtering a Mongol leader by slicing his head clean off, the remaining soldiers know exactly what will happen to them, and they know Jin has shown no signs of stopping. This is the first time we see Jin weaponize the fear he creates. This is how you take down the Mongol leaders from this point forward. You aren't assassinating them like you do the rest. Assassin is a word that brings to mind a deliberate discretion. You are slaughtering them, putting your brutality on display, and that is why you cannot slaughter the leaders quietly. Your goal is not to kill them, but to make an example. It's effective when trying to turn the tide of battle in your favor, but it's in direct violation of the Bushido. Once the people of Yarikawa are convinced to help the samurai, we begin our assault on Castle Shimura. But before we do, we get some more bonding time between Shimura and Jin, where it's revealed that Shimura is happy to put the past events behind the two, and he also revealed that he had a plan to adopt Jin. This was the perfect time to add this tension because it came right after a moment where Jin has become more ghost than samurai, and before we see Jin reaching a point of no return. Despite Jin's success as the ghost, he has to deal with the consequences of inspiring the people and his enemies. One said consequence is Taka. The ghost saved Taka, and he wanted to help in any way he could ever since. This unfortunately leads to him, in an attempt to help Jin catch Ryuzo, being captured. Taka is then forced by Koten to kill Jin, but instead tries to take down the Khan, and fails. This death, one of a character that was guaranteed safe passage to the mainland the next day with his sister, is tragic, and the first consequence Jin must face for his actions. <laughs>
During the siege of Yarikawa, Jin tells the people that they are the fighters, and while that is a great pep talk for the moment, it just isn't true. Sure, they are all capable of that with some training, but Taka didn't get that, and when facing a Khan with as much skill as Koten, no amount of courage can tip the scales his way. The ghost is not powerful because of heart alone, it's because of his skill, training, and experience. If Jin hadn't inspired Taka, there's a chance he would have survived. This point isn't precisely brought up by the game, but it's interesting food for thought, especially when reflecting on the events that come directly after. Jin is able to, with the help of Yuna, escape, but not before she sees her brother's body. With no reasons left to leave, she decides to continue helping Jin in the coming attack of Castle Shimura. Storming the gates of Castle Shimura is as climactic as it gets, and it's within its walls where Shimura sees Jin's methods firsthand, and he's left in utter horror. It says a lot about Shimura's values when a hundred slaughtered Mongols don't phase him, but the sight of a loved one executing a commander in an irredeemable way is enough to crack his composure. Once we make it through the first few gates, we come to a single bridge separating the samurai from the Mongols, and Shimura sends his men across the bridge where the Mongols kill them all, and burn down the bridge in the process. This is a devastating loss, and yet Shimura's plan is to go out to the bridge, rebuild it, and try again. This is by far the largest hole we've seen in the samurai way. Shimura and his fellow samurai believe that you should follow your lord's orders no matter the cost. The situation begs the counterpoint. What if your lord is incompetent? If Shimura were to follow through with this plan, he would have doomed his entire army and then the people of Tsushima. This is not a matter of honor getting in the way either. There are honorable ways to win. Shimura could have men watching the base from towers, men surrounding the mountain's perimeter and have a group patrolling the perimeter and the rest holding the bridge. This way, no matter what way the Mongols try to escape, they'll be seen by the samurai, and that way they can control the environment they fight in, or better yet, prepare for an ambush of their own. Regardless of the alternative routes, that isn't the main issue. It's not that Shimura didn't choose those other options, it's that he flat out didn't consider them. He decides within minutes to rebuild the bridge, which seems like the worst plan, and the one with the highest rate of mortality. This is supposed to be the person leading the remaining samurai, and he, despite wanting to protect the island, is the fastest to dispose of them. It genuinely seems Shimura, whether through ego or honor, is so far up his own ass that he can't handle any criticism, even slapping Jin for suggesting that he might be wrong. This altercation following the attack is a breaking point for Jin, and it's the first time the two have had a proper argument over whether honor is still worth pursuing. To quote Jin, honor died on the beach. Yuna, has a different plan. She encourages Jin to poison the Mongols. It would take them out, have the fewest samurai casualties, and the alternative is a death sentence. While Jin is initially hesitant, his argument with Shimura pushes him over the edge, and he performs his most dishonorable act yet. With the Mongols all dead, Jin moves to the Khan, but only finds Ryuzo, explaining that the Khan has fled to the north. It's during yet another excellent fight against Ryuzo that we see more hypocrisy from Jin as he encourages Ryuzo to surrender and pay for his crimes. When Ryuzo counters with the obvious, that Jin broke his code, he says that he simply did what he had to. Jin is a massive hypocrite throughout the game, and not because of any poor writing, but because he truly is a flawed and conflicted character. Jin knows the values of the samurai and the people, but when the people of Tsushima are at stake, any action, no matter how radical, is justified. Once Ryuzo falls and Shimura sees what Jin has done, he's forced to make a move, and we finally get a clear idea of what our consequences will be. Shimura explains that the Shogun will want someone's head, but he implies that if Jin renounces the ghost and blames the massacre on Yuna, his reputation and life can be saved. Even on Shimura's end, we can see how someone's honor can bend when the situation is dire. Shimura never liked Yuna because she was a thief, but he is now plainly showing a disregard for her life, and yet, I can't help but sympathize with Shimura. His unofficial adoptive son is tarnishing what is left of his family name, and is acting like a monster. Shimura genuinely believes that answering to the Shogun whether right or wrong is the way to a good life, and he isn't wrong. Castle Shimura is a fortress, and compared to any of the other homes in Tsushima, it's clear which life is more comfortable. So perhaps his offer to sacrifice Yuna is not an inherently evil deed, but a desperate man doing what he can to stop his heir from practically dying before his eyes. It's a respectable effort, and yet, it is in vain. Jin's decision to embrace the ghost is sound. Despite any emotional ties, Jin sees that the samurai aren't as effective as the ghost. I find it interesting, though, that Jin likely could not have done much without the samurai's training. Even in situations such as this, Jin is collected, stoic, and composed. He's aware of the sacrifice, but has the mental fortitude to make it, and the skills to back it up. Regardless, he submits, which I found odd. Jin likely could have escaped with a smoke bomb, but I feel like I'm walking the line in regards to nitpicks here. The upside of Jin being captured is a unique escape sequence where he has no weapons. It's here where we get an idea of what the ghost is to the Shogun, which is unsurprisingly a disgrace to the warrior's path. This leads to a chase and then the death of your horse. I feel like this is a common trope, but it was well done here. So often is Jin seen with his horse, Kage in my case, and what further sells this death is that while you can get a new horse, you cannot get one that looks like your old horse, and you can't 
give it the same name. It'll never be the same, and our new steed, in my case Nobu, never reaches the same connection. This may have been a product of luck, but Jin never told Nobu that they would one day go for a peaceful ride. I believe this is because by now, Jin knows better. He's too far gone, and even if the Mongols are beaten, he'll be hunted by the Shogun for the rest of his life. As Jin continues to journey on, he falls to the Mongol poison, before barely being saved by Yuna. This is expanded upon later, the ramifications of Jin poisoning the Mongols. It seems they were able to reverse engineer the poison and are preparing to mass produce it and deploy said poison on the mainland. This likely would not have happened without Jin, and it's the biggest counterpoint to the ghost. The ghost was necessitated by an enemy that didn't play by the rules. Jin's initial efforts were in line with what the Mongols did, sneaking, brutality, and bloodshed. But when Jin raises the bar to his enemies, they raise it back against his greatest weakness. Jin's goal is to protect the people of Tsushima, and when the Mongols use his own tools against the ghost, their target isn't the elusive figure himself, it is the people. It makes sense, then, to blame every poisoned citizen on Jin. The problem the island faces is that the ghost may become the standard, and if that's the case, then the samurai will lose their power. And this is why the ghost is an inherent threat. The final act is the most focused of the three, and it is also its shortest. Jin is left with no one but Yuna, and is exiled from much of the island. We have an excellent mission where we must, without killing anyone, sneak back into Castle Shimura to deliver a note requesting the Shogun's help in killing the Khan, and once we regroup with our allies, we make a play for Koten. And unfortunately, I found this to be one of the weakest fights in the game. Koten's first phase is challenging, varied, and fun, but his second phase sees him acting as a regular enemy amongst the crowd. What furthers my disappointment is the poison arrows, which will obscure your vision until you heal to get rid of its effect. It means I'm forced to use valuable resolve for what would otherwise be a minor chunk of damage, and when there are this many archers and attacks to watch out for, it doesn't really feel fair. And perhaps that's the point. The Mongols have fought dirty throughout the entire story, and it's only appropriate that the Khan does not respect the rules of the samurai or even the rules of the game up to this point. Regardless, the Khan eventually does fall, with both the ghost and the Khan telling the other that they won't be remembered, and both are correct. The Khan won't be remembered because he failed. His memory will be his proximity to success, if he's ever remembered at all. Jin, on the other hand, at most, will be a rumor. Jin Sakai died on Komoda Beach, and there's a high chance that the Shogun will perpetuate the myth of the ghost, because if the people knew he's real, then he acts as a living symbol of samurai defiance. To save the reputation of the samurai, they will likely pretend that he died with his fellow men on the beach. The same was true for Tayadori. I felt that while killing the Khan was underwhelming, I also feel that it was meant to be underwhelming. While slaying the Khan was our goal, the story has little to do with him, and instead, the Khan's death is a victory lap. Now that the ghost has full control over Jin's vessel, Jin escapes the Khan's burning ship with Yuna and the two part ways, with both being alone. Yuna explains to Jin that he belongs to everyone, and this is true. He is the symbol of hope that has emerged from this attempted invasion, and even if he had to dishonor his own name to save the people, when it's life or death, it's hard to argue that honor still prevails. Now with little else to do, Jin attempts to reconnect with his uncle. The two share a walk at the home of Clan Sakai, and it's here we see the in-person effects of the ghost, as a citizen explains to the two that the ghost is building an army. Shimura, whether he believes Jin's reassuring words, explains that the ghost alone is a symbol of defiance, and its existence undermines the samurai's power. As we approached our destination, I began to think about what Shimura was going to do after all this, and then it clicked. We are sitting at the graveyard of seven generations of Sakai's. Jin is a traitor, Shimura is loyal to the Shogun, and the Shogun wants him dead. Oh no. Just as I realized what was happening, Shimura began to tear up, and I now understand why the Khan fight got a bit underwhelming, because the Khan was never the true antagonist. The real antagonist is the Samurai's honor code, and his last stand is Lord Shimura. The two are the last remaining members of their respective clans, and they take their time to write their final words. This scene is shot so beautifully. On the right side, we have Shimura, shrouded by a tree that I believe symbolizes age and tradition. He lives under the honor code and will follow their tenants no matter how outdated they might be. On the left, there's Jin, who's under a bright sun, symbolizing a new age, specifically the new methods that must be adapted before the samurai further become victims to their honor. It's here that we get the climax of the two ideologies, and their clash is made as clear as day. During the fight, we unravel even more tension about how Shimura feels Jin is a failure, and this is dialogue I heard plenty of because I died many times to Shimura. I was told that it was one of the easier fights, but not for me, and I'm glad it wasn't because I know it's something heartbreaking. In every battle, no matter the enemy, when you're struck down, they will stand over your body and deal the final blow. The only enemy to not do this is Shimura. This is a small detail that reinforces his hatred for what he must do. Whether it's hesitation or respect, it says more than words. Throughout the game, we have been at odds with the samurai code, and we've never had a choice in becoming the ghost, and yet once this fight is finished, we're given our first actual choice, to kill or spare Shimura. 
You may think this is a simple choice, killing him is an evil option, but that's where Sucker Punch's past has led you wrong. While the choices in Infamous have always been a binary good and evil, this isn't a question of morality. Shimura wants death. He has lost a fair duel, and to die by the victor's blade is to die with honor. To be spared is humiliation. While sparing Shimura might be a net positive in terms of characters that survive, assuming he isn't shunned by the Shogun for failing, killing Shimura is a final show of respect to your uncle, and evidence that there is still honor within you. This is why I chose to kill Shimura on my first playthrough. I knew that to Shimura, being humiliated one last time by a nephew that has tarnished his family's name is a fate worse than death. There's likely a part of him that, while not fearing death, welcomes it, as he won't have to witness his nephew dishonor any longer. I've criticized the Infamous series for not having difficult choices, and yet Sucker Punch nailed this one, because both options are equally justifiable. Look at any discussion of the ending online and you'll find plenty of people arguing for both sides, and that's what a choice like this should be. If you spare Shimura, he tells you that the ghost will be hunted for the rest of his days and Jin puts on the mask and just walks away. Alternatively, you can see Jin deal the killing blow to his uncle as a final symbol of respect, and Jin finally loses his composure. Throughout the entire ordeal, Jin is able to keep it together, but finally killing his uncle breaks him. The game ends with a beautiful song paired with a fade to white, and it's credits from there. After the credits, Jin wakes in an abandoned house he now calls home, filled with trinkets from his adventures. It's a somber but appropriate end to the story. It was always going to come to this. Jin's descent into the ghost is so well done because it's not clear cut. Evidence of this is any discussion online, which sees people going back and forth over when Jin fully becomes the ghost. While the Khan might not be the true antagonist of the story, he works exceptionally well as a villain. I already mentioned how intelligent he is, but I also appreciated how reasonable he was. Not reasonable in the fair sense, but in the sense that he only tortured as long as the people resisted. At multiple points, he gives both Jin and Shimura the option to surrender, and the Khan rarely acts out of emotion, instead doing what is most logical most of the time. There's an argument to be made that by the time the Khan has Jin tied up that he should have killed him, because Jin was already too much trouble for him. We could also view his many offers as a taunt, because surely he knows the samurai would be too arrogant to even consider an offer, regardless of how many casualties are suffered. Overall, I thoroughly enjoyed the story told in Ghost of Tsushima. It paid homage in so many ways to the samurai films that inspired it, and yet remains unique in its take on the honor code. When people discuss the game, one of the first talking points is always the story, and it's easy to see why. It's full of twists, drama, and some damn fine characters enhanced by their side quests. I'll admit that things slow down near the midway point of Act 1, and Act 2 is slow to start, but by the time you hit the Siege of Yarikawa, it's a roller coaster until the end. I also appreciated that this game does not take a definitive stance on everything. Whether Jin is wrong or right in his actions is debatable, because while he does help the people, he inadvertently hurts people too. On the other hand, the samurai code ideally is admirable, but as the game immediately deconstructs, this honor only works when everyone follows the rules, and it further crumbles when the samurai abuse their status, and begin seeing those under them as resources in a war. Whether it was right or wrong, the ghost was a necessity, and its evolution from a rumor to a widely believed legend is satisfying. But the ghost is not the only legend. The game itself has achieved a status many games would dream of, and this status is likely what inspired the director's cut of the game, along with a free content update that introduces the Legends game mode. A mutated disease. Plaguing another victim. Infecting the bliss. While I'm going to look at Legends harshly because there are some severe issues within, I cannot stress enough that it is free. This video's intention is not to evaluate Ghost of Tsushima as a consumed product tied to a price, but if it were, value-wise, Legends would be the perfect DLC. With that said, disconnected from its price, Legends is a unique post-game that offers more stunning visuals, deeper gameplay, more extravagant customization, and yet its confidence restrains its greatness. There's no greater poetry than Legends mode being both more varied from the base game and yet even more repetitive. Upon first glance, Legends looks amazing. Environments are very beautiful nightmares that you can play with friends, and while its story is loose, it does enough to excuse whatever location you travel to. The largest innovation you'll notice is that the ghosts are split into classes, namely the Ronin, Samurai, Assassin, and Archer. 
All the classes have their strengths, many of which are evident by the name alone, save for the Ronin, which acts as a support class. Within each class is a skill set, not a tree, where you can equip skills and gear before jumping into battle. While there are different builds within the classes, achieving those builds is rather difficult for reasons I'll get into later. For now, I'll say that creating your perfect build is satisfying ideally. Once you convince a friend to join you, you'll find remedies to the Plagues of Tsushima's campaign. There are some story missions you can attempt with three tiers of difficulty segregated by gear score, and while you may assume the only difference is damage given and taken, and you'd partially be correct, there's more here. On the higher difficulties, you'll have challenges to complicate encounters, such as requiring players to imbue their weapons with auras that correspond to an enemy's color. Others include enemies with more complex movesets, enemies that are soul-linked and must be killed at the same time, and more. The enemy layouts are randomized each time you attempt a mission, which further adds variety, but there's a notable restriction that works in the game's favor. When you have four classes of ghosts with Jin's ability split among them, and a restriction of two players only for the story missions, you see boundaries. I played a majority of these with Sean, a fellow creator and the one editing this video, and he chose to use the Samurai class, where I stuck with the Assassin class. This made us ill-equipped for support and range. Playing around these weaknesses was fun, and it was always interesting to see a problem in front of us and decide how we should use our individual skills in tandem to get by. Each difficulty has a level range, and when you're on the lower end, you'll find that you have to be more tactical, but by the mid-range and up, it's just cruising. At the end of a challenge, you're given a bit of loot, and it's here that we see a frustrating part of Legends mode. The loot you receive is often solid, but is influenced by the gear you have equipped. For example, if your gear score is 50, you will always receive gear slightly better than that. Raising gear score isn't just important for progressing your characters, but many game modes are gated by a minimum gear score requirement. You'll often have to sacrifice your gear for one that is worse but has a higher score. For example, I can't stand the blow darts, and I frequently get less mileage out of it compared to the bow. Despite this, because I hadn't gotten a bow drop for the last few runs, I was forced to use a ranged weapon I didn't enjoy because I needed to raise the overall gear score and thus the rewarded loot. You can re-roll an item to potentially increase its gear score, allowing items to have some longevity, but it costs a lot of resources to do so. At times, I had a perfect build where every piece clicked together, but in others, I was sacrificing at every turn and feeling more frustrated than anything. So, if you can't have variety in gear, you could swap classes. But here we have another issue, which is that because each class starts from zero with no skills, swapping to a different class at any point past the mid-game is further debilitating, and incites a longer grind. But, what are you grinding for? Would you believe me if I said the end of the story at hand? Throughout the story missions, you'll be chasing after a demon, but you never get to actually encounter them, and instead, must play a separate campaign which has a required gear score of 100. This means grinding the game, replaying missions, for hours on end, just to get the opportunity to continue the story. What's further annoying is that this first part of the story can only be completed with two people, but the final three must be completed with four. While this doesn't sound too bad outside of the inconvenience, if anyone disconnects during a mission, the mission ends. What this results in is a crapshoot unless you have four friends who all meet the level requirements to help you. I've harped on this enough. The grind is ridiculous, but I also have to be honest. I somewhat enjoyed the grind. Maybe it's because you're forced to do it with a friend, but even at its most mindless, there was fun to be had in strategizing and working around everyone's strengths. I knew Sean could handle combat, and that I was proficient in stealth, so using abilities and tools to maximize both mine and Sean's efficiency was rewarding. Doubly so if we dunk on some Mongol and play our flutes in celebration. Now, in fairness, if I weren't forced to do this, there's a good chance I wouldn't, but what's here is fine, and it's heavily supported and supplemented by the additions to gameplay. Enemy layouts are much the same here, but the enemies themselves, especially on the higher difficulties, utilize a supernatural setting to offer greater challenge. They even take boss fights and introduce them into ordinary encounters. Certain modifiers offer challenges too, as well as added challenges on top of that like opening an oni chest where a difficult wave of enemies appear. I'd often find myself saving my abilities for this specific challenge, and even then, it was a struggle at times. But a good struggle. It always felt fair, unless lag was in the way, but even then, as I was connected to Sean, who was literally on the other side of the globe, it was very rare to see any delays. The most difficult challenge was where, for the final wave of a chapter, you were bound, and had to stay close to one another, lest you take consistent damage. It forced Sean and I to work together more closely, and at first it was a challenge, but eventually it taught us the utility of our partnership, and how our skills complement one another. Some of the unique enemies, like the ghosts, which can only be viewed up closer by activating a nearby lantern, were enjoyable, and while at first a teleporting enemy was 
a tall order, the telegraphing of attacks was wide enough that it never felt like an unfair challenge. Overall, the enemies here are great, even when they can combo you to death off of one mistake, but I have a particular bone to pick with the crows. The crows are difficult enemies, but they have one attack where they send a barrage of crows at you that deal consistent damage, and the game informs you that you can roll or run away to dodge them, and let me tell you, that is not true. It's by far the most annoying enemy in the game, but I can't harp on it too much because otherwise this is some fun gameplay. To give some context to the next section, I like endgame raids. I loved Borderlands 2 and farming bosses with my friends and half the reason it was fun was because you had to work for it. Sure, you could do it solo, but it was very discouraged. So I expected the tale of EO to be a truly epic challenge. And as my anticipation reached a boiling point, I had a thought. What if this is comically underwhelming? After reaching Starrow and Gotham Knights, I've had trust issues, and you know what? The Tales of EO have some real high points, but the low points left me dumbfounded. The Tales of EO are challenging, reward insane gear, and provide great set pieces, but it's also the most frustrating, tedious gameplay in Ghost of Tsushima that was so bad, it became funny. It may not seem this way at first, as the beginning chapter is a run-of-the-mill mission that is more difficult, however, there is a new mechanic and running issue that is introduced, which is the Soul Rings. It's a basic challenge where you have to kill an enemy inside a ring, but as you stay in the ring, you become corrupted. If your corruption becomes too high, then you have to go to a separate ring to have it drained. Once you've killed enough enemies, a mechanism will activate. This is a fine puzzle, but the issue I take with it is that there is no instruction or tutorial for it. Granted, it was easy enough to figure it out. Myself and Sean brute forced it after a few minutes. Then we got to chapter two. Chapter one was about half an hour, which is a solid length for an endgame challenge. Chapter two, on the other hand, can take hours on a first attempt, and even experienced players can spend up to 45 five minutes on it. You may think that this is because we get to engage with the excellent combat and you'd be half right and half abhorrently wrong. The chapter begins like normal until you reach a segment where there are three attunements that correspond with platforms that only appear if the person with the correct attunement lands on them. This alone isn't too bad, but here's something you may not realize. The one person who does not have the attunement is the only one who can see what attunement is required for the next platform. This is beyond tedious and when you are playing with people who do not have microphones, you can imagine the brutality that is on your brain. And mind you, this is not a single puzzle. This gimmick is reused throughout the entire chapter and later on there are time limits too, making this borderline impossible without a microphone. Sean and I were able to matchmake with some randoms to get this sorted, but eventually they started jumping off every time and without explanation. They had no mic so we tried to message them and we got no response. So now not only did we dump 30 minutes into getting this far, but then we had people throwing and eventually leaving the game. But here's the thing, we later found out that they weren't throwing and rather they're trying to convince everyone to jump off the ledge. It's a common glitch that lets you skip a portion of the chapter, which is great, but there's no way me and Sean were supposed to know that. Anyways, after we realized that attempting this with randoms was not the intended experience, which was supported by my research as we found that public matchmaking wasn't introduced until after the launch of Legends, we sent out the signal flare via Twitter and a YouTube community post, and I want to take a moment to thank everyone who offered help. I wasn't able to respond to everyone, but if you offered to help in any way, then you have my utmost gratitude. Seriously. Either way, we were able to connect with Wolfhawk and Mason David, who were experts in Legends. And it's because of them that not only were we able to get through the trials, but we also learned a lot about what a high-level player thinks of Legends. When asking Wolfhawk more about what he thought, he said that while the individual story missions may not be the best, the grind itself is fun. He said that the biggest change he would make would be in regards to balance, as an Archer class can farm their ultimate quite easily, and he believes that reworking the way Resolve is gained would solve that. There some other gripes about certain items not being as good as they could be, but otherwise, what's here is great. They recommended that players get to level 120 because it opens the game in terms of builds and the gameplay becomes more interesting. I felt it was important to get Wolfhawk's opinion on this because he is well experienced in Legends, and while I've definitely engaged with the content, I have close to 30 hours in it by now, the time it would take to get to the hundreds of hours would prolong the release of this video by too much, and for a diminishing gain. For what it's worth, I agree with Wolfhawk, and I can't thank you and Mason David enough for helping us out here. The final chapter sees everyone taking turns in a one-on-one -on -one boss fight against EO. She has a colossal form and sends waves of enemies, but one ghost must journey through a portal to face her one-on-one, -on -one, and this fight is tough. Her range is long, attacks fast, and the damage is devastating. Where this fight is unique is in that you can only fight her for so long, as there's a pseudo-timer. Meaning while you're inside, your friends on the outside have to fend off the waves and pull you out at the right time. But then, EO on the outside will have different auras around her. But only the person on the inside knows which is the correct one, so there must be constant communication, cooperation, and while the fight is only a few minutes once you're used to it, it's an excellent set piece to end off this trial. When the game wants to encourage cooperation, this is the way it should be done. And yet the criticism remains that this 
requires a microphone and people who, to some extent, know what they're doing. But as I criticize this, I can't help but ask. Is it the game's fault and or responsibility? The short answer is no. But I also think the game could do more to ensure that those who are queuing are both adequately aware of what is expected of them and are prepared to communicate. Legends has the skill part figured out. Tons of missions are level gated, including the Tales of EO, so you won't get somebody who's a complete noob in the later missions. What they could further do is somehow ensure that those who are queuing have a working microphone or at least a warning that explains how important communication is. A simpler solution may be to implement an option to turn crossplay off, to at least ensure that those on PS5 can guarantee the other person has a microphone, as the DualSense 5 comes with a built-in microphone. But even this is a band-aid fix that doesn't fully cover the wound. Ultimately, this is an issue I take with the concept of endgame raids as a whole. This was designed for four players, and I think I just need to get over that. Overall, Legends Mode is a solid addition to the game that continues the trends of the astounding visuals, great atmosphere, and it offers a gameplay loop that is better than the base game. It gives combat and stealth new variety, and while not all new additions are a success, it's a sacrifice worth making. It's poetic that the repetition and grind this game requires is once again its greatest downfall, but at least the repetition is this time by design. It confirms to me that if Sucker Punch were to make a sequel, they would have have what it takes to innovate, and they prove that sentiment without a doubt in the other expansion for Ghost of Tsushima, appropriately titled Iki Island. A Master's Footnote A blade's dull edge unsharpened. Repeated or practiced? While the story of Ghosts of Tsushima is focused and wrapped up nicely, there are a few loose ends left untied, one of the most glaring being Jin's father. The death of Jin's father is one shown to us many times, and his spirit is ever present. But what of Jin's feelings on this? Well, the writers have a problem, because Jin's stoicism halts most attempts at introspection. While there are moments of reflection regarding events, they are minimal, often delegated to a hot spring or a haiku. But the death of Jin's father before his eyes is not something to be cleansed by water or words. Another question to ask is, what was Clan Sakai like? Like. We know that there's plenty of resentment for the samurai to go around, as Ryuzo and Yarikawa alone will prove, but what about Kazumasa? This is what Iki Island is about. It's about discovering more of Jin's past and forcing ourselves into his previously locked mind. We arrive on Iki Island to investigate some Mongols who are reportedly serving a woman named the Eagle, who plans to, with the use of a hallucinogenic poison, conquer the people of Tsushima. Iki Island is very much like Tsushima. It's vast, luscious, and we get the chance to start over in a few ways, learning new techniques and building a new legend, because the people of Iki haven't heard of the ghost. This DLC is more Ghost of Tsushima, with the benefit of a few addendums. Things like difficulty are properly addressed here, and the visuals get even crazier as we progress. When traveling to Iki, our boat is struck down, and upon trying to take down the eagle herself, because some of that samurai arrogance is still within Jin, he's captured and forced to drink her poison. Jin begins experiencing visions of his past, his guilt, and these intrusive thoughts are a perfect way of prying open Jin's mind. We eventually are aided by a raider named Tenzo, who is remarkably older than Jin, and has a deep hatred for his father, not knowing Jin's true identity. He introduces Jin to the rest of the raiders who share the hatred for the Sakai name, to the point where the game won't allow you to don your Sakai armor until your identity is revealed. We prove our allegiance to the raiders and eventually take down the eagle, while uncovering along the way the atrocities Jin's father had committed. There is an argument made throughout the DLC that perhaps Kazumasa had what was coming to him. The samurai, for all the good that they did and for how beneficial they were on paper, were not always right, and if there's one thing the base game showed us, it's that the samurai have indirectly killed a lot of people, either through a stubborn adherence to an honor code, or through their lord's exceptionally poor leadership. The conflict on Iki isn't as simple as it seems, though. Iki Island is a dangerous place because of its high density of raiders and bandits. The samurai arrived to try and enforce their law, their code, onto them, which resulted in resistance. This resistance fed into more punishment from the samurai until things reached a boiling point. The raiders, under the assumption that the samurai were there to kill them, had murdered some samurai in their sleep which then prompted the samurai to slaughter the raiders and the innocents that were aiding them. In short, both sides are in the wrong. The raiders and bandits are definitely no moral paragons, but the samurai are equally as guilty, even if they veil their war crimes under honor. Tenzo and Jin know about this conflict, but only on one side, leading to many discussions and arguments, all culminating in both finding out their true identity. Jin finds out that Tenzo killed his father, and Tenzo finds out that Jin was more than aligned with the Sakai invasion. This kind of drama early on, the tension of protecting Jin's identity, and then the tension of Jin having helped his father's killer, allows this DLC to flow effortlessly over three hours unless 
Ross and One. Within this drama, Jin is given yet another test of his morality against his honor. Does he kill Tenzo, perpetuating a hatred for the samurai that resulted in so many innocent deaths, but also avenging his father, or spare Tenzo? End this conflict and allow his father's death to go unavenged. The choice isn't simple through Jin's eyes. It might be easy to view the decision and say that the crime is too far in the past and that it's not worth continuing the bad blood between the Sakai clan and Iki Island, but Jin has been haunted by the image of his father being cut down before his eyes for most of his life, and the thought of finally achieving closure is nothing short of tantalizing, I'm sure. Jin takes the high road and decides that they'll deal with it after the eagle is defeated, as it only benefits her for the two to continue fighting. As the game progresses, Jin's hallucinations become worse, and it's told that unless he stops the eagle, he will die. This added tension doesn't land as well because it's not explained how exactly beating the crow would get rid of the hallucinations, and when you do defeat her, the hallucinations just disappear. It's not a big deal, but it's shown that many, even after the eagle's death, are suffering from the poison, so what's different for them? Maybe the only way to cure yourself is to work through the pain that the hallucinations show you. But there are hallucinations regarding the trust of the raiders, Lord Shimura, and yet those are relatively unresolved. It is stated in a side quest that Jin was able to overcome the hallucinations through accepting his fear, and it's likely unrealistic to act like the hallucinations should only leave upon confronting and accepting every issue in Jin's life, but regardless, these hallucinations are increasingly enjoyable, as we get appetizers to the eagle's fight. She appears in these hallucinations and seems to be yet another easy fight, but let me assure you, her actual fight is significantly harder. She attacks quickly, has change-ups in her combos, and enough health to make this a test of endurance as much as it is a test of skill. It's one of the most challenging fights in the game, yet it doesn't go into unfair territory. Once defeated, we get our final trip, where we relive the fateful murder of Kazumasa. Only this time, we have the opportunity to rise up and strike down Tenzo. Jin, once again, makes the wise decision to spare Tenzo, and learns to move forward as allies. I appreciated that there wasn't a choice like there was with Shimura. It's pretty clear that the correct choice is to spare Tenzo, and while I can appreciate the closure his death would bring, Jin's journey on Iki is not to avenge or redeem his father, but right his father's wrongs. While both sides were wrong in many ways, there's a part of me that believes Kazumasa had it coming and if the roles were reversed, he wouldn't think twice about cutting down Tenzo. Perhaps this is my own bias against the Bushido coming through, but I believe Kazumasa deserved it to an extent. We end our journey by finally reflecting on our father's death in a haiku, and at this point, it feels well earned. Overall, the story of Iki Island was well done, much like the base game. I think using hallucinations and the history of Iki as a device to unfold Jin's personality is a great idea, and it proves that the writers here, despite any repetition in the main story, are more than capable of coming up with new struggles, and new ways of unpacking old arguments. Repetition is used well this time, as certain tropes like your horse dying and Yuna arriving to save you are used against the player in a humorous way. We only believe these fakeouts because we know Sucker Punch is capable of recycling ideas, and I couldn't help but appreciate the way they turned a weakness into a strength here. The quality continues into the side content, which while similar to the main game and concept, is also similar in enjoyment, for better or worse. Side content is the same business of clearing outposts and helping the people, but fundamentally there are some sorely needed changes to combat. When first traveling to Iki, you receive a warning that the enemies here will be a cut above the rest, and that rings true. The biggest addition is the shamans, who through performing a chant can put their Mongol underlings into a state of rage where they can attack constantly. It is still possible to attack these enemies when they're in their trance, but it's significantly harder, meaning your best bet is to go for the shaman. And this is the exact kind of restriction I was looking for when I criticized the self. When you enter a camp, ones at this time around have what feels like fewer hiding spots, you'll be actively scanning the area to see where the shamans are so you can take them out first, and often, they are in very tricky places. This gives stealth more of a challenge, and thus makes it less repetitive. When we block off the easy route, we are forced to get creative, and the same is somewhat true in combat. While the shamans in combat translate to a loop of immediately running towards them, I appreciate that their inclusion adds some kind of variety. The other new enemy type is a brute that wields a double-bladed staff, and these guys suck. Not because they're poorly designed, but because they kick my ass like you wouldn't believe. Fortunately, in one of the two mythic tales, we can obtain a possessed suit of armor that at the cost of blocking, allows us to more easily parry, perfect dodge, and deliver harder blows. This is an excellent trade-off that rewards aggression plenty, though I won't lie, I had to stop myself from using it, because it just needlessly shreds through health bars. I like this as an endgame item, and the quest itself was well-rounded, seeing you using flaming arrows to find your way through a cave, eventually having a duel. It's run-of-the-mill, as is the hunt for the horse armor of Kazumasa Sakai. Seeing Jin face the facade of a storyteller and eventually interrupt the story made sense, and it was a major step for redeeming the Sakai legacy. At first, I was confused as to why Jin cared so much for redeeming the legacy of someone who is no longer around, part of a now disbanded samurai clan, the bloodline of which is entirely dishonored. But I realized that Jin's purpose in helping the people is not to redeem his father or the Sakai name, but to tie up loose ends. Obviously, saving a few raiders won't make them all square, but it sets a precedent going forward that the Sakai name no longer breeds fear. Once his father's conflicts are resolved and his wrongs,
wrongs rectified, he can rest, and so can Jin. The horse armor you get looks great too, as it matches a Sakai set, and I imagine it's awarded because at this point, once redeeming your legacy, you've earned the right to don the full outfit of Kazumasa. As you explore the gorgeous hills of Iki, you may come across someone building a home. You can run into him in different locations offering supplies until eventually his home is built, but the catch with this quest, and a few others, is that it's not marked in any way. I wondered why they took this approach to some of the quests. Was it to make Iki feel more alive and organic? Unlikely because the game labels them as hidden quests. Was it to pad the experience? Also unlikely because the DLC is already quite long when including the side content. Regardless, the quests and activities here are varied enough, but fall into the similar traps of clearing a base or only tapping a few buttons. I enjoyed the variety of songs you play, even if it is a Japanese trombone champ, but it's still not the mechanical step up people were likely hoping for. As argued previously, there's a chance that the step up isn't needed or even possible, but the point remains. This is more Ghost of Tsushima, and while there are plenty of new things here, the fundamentals, right or wrong, are the same. The two most prominent new tools are the Horse Charge and the Grappling Hook, which receives new utility. The Horse Charge allows patrolling the wilderness to be more efficient, and it is helpful when targeting the stronger enemies before a fight ensues, but the Grappling Hook pull ability was downright unneeded. In the beginning of the DLC, you're shown to be able to pull down certain objects with a very tedious and slow animation, and while that is helpful in some scenarios, Scenarios, in many instances, you are pulling down a wall of bamboo that is directly in front of you, which Jin could easily cut down with his sword. In fact, he does it with ease many times in the main game and here. I would have enjoyed some use of this in combat, maybe have an ability where if Jin is behind an enemy, he can pull them on their back, allowing for a follow-up attack. But in his bare-bones state here, it feels more redundant than anything. Another feature that I did not care for was the return of Kenji, whose quest, while entertaining, still has relatively little to say in my eyes. Which, while likely not the intention, he's always been a vehicle for comedy, it was disappointing here because the DLC tries to have a touching side moment, and it doesn't stick the landing in my eyes. When assisting Fune in a quest to rescue her daughter, we're told that she lost her daughter years ago, but not why or how. Once we find her, we see that she's beyond saving, having seemingly overdosed. We're only then told that Fune's daughter had a long history with addiction after being exiled from the raiders, with Fune even finding finding her years later, stuck in a trip, having soiled herself for days on end. Fune couldn't even bring herself to wake her daughter when seeing her in that state, as if she had already died but the body was still barely functioning. I don't mean to come off as insensitive, I've seen how addiction can tear a family apart, and there's always the question of at what point do you just let someone make their own decisions? When do you give up? Should you give up? But this is all cut short by the introduction of this being so sudden. I know there's an obvious comparison to Yuriko and her fleeting memory, both subjects becoming hollow as their brains continue to be hindered, but the build-up makes all the difference. With Yuriko, there were signs of her memory loss early on and we spent the mission not just painting those increasingly blurry recollections of her memories, but we learned what Yuriko and Jin mean to each other. So when tragedy strikes, it hits hard. Here, it all moves too fast. The one thing I can praise is the familiarity. Fune has a family member that because of her foolish actions must be cast out, despite the love she has for her. And doesn't that sound like what Shimura was dealing with? We painted the samurai as something that is either right or wrong when analyzing the story, but if we imagine that the samurai way is the correct one, and truly believe it like Shimura does, then we see just how much he's lost and I appreciate that this quest allowed me to view the story with that new lens. To end this discussion on a more enjoyable note, we can talk about the fight ring, which brings us back to the tutorial fight against Shimura, where the goal was not to whittle down the stamina and health, but to simply land a single hit. You and a variety of opponents with different fighting styles will face off, and the first of five strikes wins. I enjoyed this mission plenty, though it does fall into a tedium trap for me. After each strike, you must reset, which translates to a few seconds of waiting, and each opponent has a particular method for taking them down. For some, it's perfect dodging, others a perfect parry, but for some, the answer is undefined defined and or inconsistent, as I found when battling the monk. Minor hiccups aside, this was a nice idea, and the reward was great. Those Crimson Dyes alone justify a New Game Plus playthrough. Overall, the Iki Island DLC was done right. I couldn't shake a feeling during the main game. Was Sucker Punch's success, in spite of this game being a contradiction to their prior releases, the work of experts or a beginner's luck in a new field? Iki Island is a resounding answer. This was no accident. Sucker Punch have proven themselves not only to be masters of their craft, but ones capable of range and diversity. I was not anticipating a sequel for Ghost of Tsushima, but after seeing how much better the gameplay can get, deeper the stories can be, prettier the world can bloom, I already can't wait. But if a sequel were to occur, then we need a fundamental change to the level design. While Infamous is the antithesis to Ghost of Tsushima, the two games cannot be more alike in objectives. Both see you dropped into a scenario with the player taking responsibility over their challenges and aesthetic goals, and much of the side content doesn't involve the abilities and skills you've been honing over the course of the game. This is Sucker Punch's fatal flaw, but it's one they're more than capable of correcting if they want to.
immense ambition. Met face to face once again. Breeds great achievement. Few games have spoken to me in the way Ghost of Tsushima has. Its picture of honor lost is one that extends beyond the samurai code. It's an argument for desperation and how it strains, at times breaking, the arbitrary chains that bind our actions. I reflect on this in my own life. Anyone who talks about games has varying degrees of credibility and respect. In my case, I need to, in my actions, present my point of view with honesty and sincerity, so that my audience can trust that I will, even if I'm wrong, tell them how I honestly feel. This credibility isn't entirely controlled nor defined by me. Some have mentioned that they feel I lost credibility because of inconsistencies between reviews or because my opinion did not match and therefore validate their own. This makes me want to disregard credibility as a whole because I feel it's less about being right and more about being honest honest, and even if there is no logical reason that I feel the way I do, so long as I state it plainly, I consider my job done, honorably. But when desperation strikes, we're forced to compromise. Many consider sponsor segments of videos to be harmful towards credibility because it shows the viewer that you are willing to sell your voice. I'd love to never have ads in videos, no sponsorships, no Patreon plugs, no mid-rolls. Choose my topics on what interests me and not what interests the algorithm. But when rent is due, sacrifices need to be made. Furthermore, what good is credibility and your legacy if you're never good enough to be granted, at minimum, survival? Inflation, bills, and the Canadian housing crisis don't care about your credibility. The reality is, sacrifices need to be made, and they're easily justified by the understanding that I'll never be good enough to be the best, and that my works will be forgotten as quickly as they are disregarded. And that's okay. What good would Jin's honor be if he stuck to it and failed? He would be yet another samurai among hundreds massacred. I pray my life never parallels Jin's too closely, but this theme of sacrificing morals, honor, or desires for something bigger can be applied to many situations. Ghosts of Tsushima has been a difficult game to talk about. Understanding and justifying my feelings towards it is something that cannot be done without inserting the utmost subjectivity. Granted, everything I put out is subjective, but what I mean is that my love for this game is not as simple as it being designed well, and I can't always use consistent logic to justify it. Tsushima gave me something I hold so close and rarely achieve. It's why I focus on peace so much in the opening. It's something that's hard to define and something I value greatly. For reasons I can't get into, peace and tranquility is something I can almost never achieve in life. Gaming is often an escape for me, a way to think about something, anything else for a while. I most often find peace in distraction. It's why I enjoy puzzle games or games that border on sensory overload. And it's why I hate games that make you wait. I don't like being stuck with my own thoughts when I'm supposed to be getting away from them. Ghost of Tsushima doesn't satisfy these preferences and yet through the atmosphere alone, I understood that peace isn't found in distraction but in the utmost presence. It may be foolish to apply this very personal experience to an evaluation of a game, but I can't pretend like the feelings it evoked within me weren't present, and like they don't say anything about the game itself. Any game that can provoke this kind of response is worthy of praise, and I'm not the only one who felt something playing this. From a design perspective, Ghost of Tsushima has impressive visuals and while its gameplay doesn't reinvent the wheel, there's no denying that what is here is competent, even if it doesn't gel with everyone. Those who dislike Ghost of Tsushima are likely the ones who look for the extrinsic motivators. They complete objectives because the game told them to. That's not an incorrect way to play the game, but it won't help you enjoy it. It seems like Ghost of Tsushima 2 is sure to happen. Given the game's reception, why wouldn't it? And while I would be happy to see Ghost of Tsushima with or without a sequel, the DLC proves that Sucker Punch isn't out of ideas, and that their success with the base game was no fluke. Sucker Punch has done more than proven themselves. And in regards to my feelings on Ghost of Tsushima, whether a sequel or a game comes out in the next few years doesn't really matter to me. Because what we have right now is good, and I'm content with that. To call Ghost of Tsushima memorable would be an understatement. To call it a masterpiece would be accurate, but to call it flawless would be less so. There are deep problems here, and there are valid reasons for someone to dislike aspects of this game. And even if I disagree with nearly all of them, I think one thing everyone can agree on is this game's sincerity. I don't often clearly define what that word means to me in a gaming context. To me, a sincere game is one that oozes passion, and one that was made purely to create something great even if it doesn't succeed. The attempt is there, and it's genuine. Not because some corporate overlord wanted to milk an intellectual property or their players, but because a team had a vision, and had nothing but passion and care behind their work. I believe this is why the Infamous series is so beloved. Those games weren't perfect, and in fact, the first Infamous especially is a train wreck in so many ways, and yet, 
It's a classic, because passion is that invisible glue that holds a game together and elevates it far beyond the sum of its parts. Think of Guardians of the Galaxy, The Uncharted Games, Outer Wilds, The Talos Principle, all games I had absolutely fallen in love with, and all games that above all were sincere in their goals and final product. When I think of games I enjoyed but ones that don't stick out in memory for being great, I think of games like Call of Duty. I know it's cliche to rag on this series, but while I have so many fond memories of it, I have just as many memories of a game that nickel and dimed me around every corner, and one that is released every year. Modern Warfare 2's map pool is more old maps than new, and they're even selling bundles to make their guns sound like they did back in the day. It stops me from enjoying what's here because despite any technical achievements in visuals or gameplay, I'm constantly reminded of the past and reminded that I'm consuming a product, not experience experiencing a message. Ghost of Tsushima was a game I experienced, plain and simple. I don't use that word to be dramatic, but because it's appropriate. To say it was one I played feels inaccurate. For as much time as I spent cutting down Mongols, I spent just as much time watching cutscenes, pondering over haikus, and interacting with the world through a press of a button, or simply breathing it in. To say it's a game you play is exactly why some don't like it. Ghost of Tsushima is best experienced not with a tunnel vision zeroed in on a set goal. It's best experienced when you take it all in. Don't be afraid to climb up that mountain to find what sits at its peak, but on the way up, look around. Smell the roses. Reflect on your journey. And reflect on yourself and your efforts. Ghost of Tsushima doesn't always succeed in its efforts. It may not be the best, but it shows a clear effort to be the best it can be. Jin does the same. He isn't admirable because he succeeds, in many ways he doesn't, but he tries regardless, and that's what makes him admirable. This was one of the most difficult videos I've ever made. Not knowing what to mention, what to omit, what to take a definitive stance on, what to concede, how to deliver my lines, how to convey my feelings. This likely won't be the best Ghost of Tsushima video. I might never create something perfect or better than my contemporaries. Hell, this might not even be a good video. And maybe all my efforts only ever result in a splinter above mediocrity. But I know I tried. And I know it was my best. And in that, I can find peace.